wrestling fans, it's that time of the week for them boys from 607 Podcast to talk all things pro wrestling and call it right down the middle. That's right, it's time for this week's edition of 607 Podcast presents The Wrestling Show, better known as 607TWS. We are coming to you. From the ODPH Dungeon, the realest thing in pro wrestling podcasting. Of course, I am your host, and I'm also the host of the 3FN Podcast. My name is Rich, and joining me in the co-pilot's chair as he does each and every week. But you better know him as the host of the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour Podcast, better known as the ODPH. I'm talking about Ken M. 607 Podcast family, what is going on? What is good? Why don't we talk some pro wrestling, shall we? Of course, we ought to talk all that pro wrestling. We got a lot of pro wrestling to talk about. It's been a pretty, uh, pretty awesome and eventful week in uh, in the positive way. Yes, in the positive way. So uh, I just want to throw out there: if you guys are looking forward to talking about. AEW's first ever episode of Collision, we got that covered in the main event, Mm -hmm. as well as talking about CM Punk's return, uh, which kind of goes hand in hand, if you will. And on top of all of that, Ken, on top of all of that, we will be previewing AEW in New Japan's Forbidden Door pay-per-view, which comes up this upcoming Sunday, Sunday, Sunday at uh, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Correct. So we're going to talk all about that in the main event of this uh, wonderful episode of 607 TWS in the mid card. We're going to hit that indie roundup. We're going to review uh, Game Changer Wrestling, AIW and Pro Wrestling Revolver show from this past weekend over on Fight Plus. Plus we're going to talk about the uh, AIW and three days of Game Changer Wrestling coming up in this upcoming weekend. So get ready for that in the indie roundup in the mid card. But we're going to open the show up talking some WWE more specifically the Bloodline and we've got a new pay-per-view announcement. We're going to hit all of that up in the opening contest but before we get there ken m why don't you tell the fine folks how to find yourself and the ocho duro parlay hour podcast very simple swing on over to odphpodcast.com joining the conversation on social media accounts check out the t public store link the patreon link shout out to all our amazing patrons one tier two dollars a month the blog section the classified section which has friends of this show such as three fn podcast dragon master games and so many more the directory the music section Basically, if it's anything and everything that is the ODPH, you can find it at odphpodcast.com. And if you're trying to get a hold of me in the 3FN Podcast, it's simple. Go to 3FNPodcast.com. There you can find all of our links for social media, the T Public link, the link to Patreon, patreon.com slash 3FN Podcast. For as little as $1 a month, you get a ton of extra bonus content and help support everything we do here. Also, on top of that, check out the friends of the show like the ODPH. You can stream the show right from there or go over to odphpodcast.com right from 3FNPodcast.com. Also, there's spaces there for 607 TWS and the 3FN podcast, not to mention a musical directory, which which features bands that allow us to use their music so we don't get those dreaded DMCAs. And uh, big shout outs to Floodlands. Their song Ruins is the song you hear every week to open up 607 TWS. And another shout out to our good friends, Second Suitor, whose song One Winged Angel is how we like to take it home every week here at 607 TWS. But for those two great bands, plus more, go ahead and visit the musical directory at 3FMPodcast.com and make sure you follow all of those bands on YouTube Music, Spotify, or Bandcamp, whichever one you prefer to use. And last, but certainly not least, there's a section for sponsors who help bring these shows to you commercial free. I'm going to give a quick shout out right now to W Energy Drink. Go to W.GG. That's T-U-B-B-Y dot G-G. Put in the promo code 3FNPOD. That's the number 3FNPOD for 10% off each order. Also, uh, big shout outs to Sci-Fi Horror Fest coming up August 25th and 26th in Vernon Downs Casino in Vernon, New York. If you're in the area and you want to find out about what's going down there, go to SciFiHorrorFest.com. And last but certainly not least, and our most important sponsor, our number one sponsor, our good friends over at Dragon Master Games. For all your Magic the Gathering gaming needs, visit them on the World Wide Web, DragonMasterGames.com. And thank you for helping to bring these shows commercial free to all of our wonderful listeners. And uh, once again, your one stop shop, 3FNPodcast.com's got your hookup in case you forgot any of those links. Well, Ken, that's enough of doing the plugs. That's enough about telling people how to find us. It's time to finally talk some pro wrestling. So I need you to check your watch because. It's time! 
That's right. It is time to kick off this week's edition of 607 TWS. And we're going to open up with, you know, I feel like we open with this a lot. But how can you not, Ken? How can you not open up talking about the hottest storyline in all of pro wrestling, possibly in the history of pro wrestling? Not just right now. Definitely right now. 100% right now. But possibly the greatest storyline of all time. It's hard to debate it, to be honest with you. I was in there trying to think, like, what rivals it at this stage? Because it's been going on for years now, and it still is getting better and better. And the crowd watching in the arena, the crowd watching online, is still mesmerized by the work being done by the Bloodline. Of course, the Bloodline storyline, exactly. And uh, we got another huge chunk and two big announcements coming out of that. Of course, this past week on SmackDown, as we record, we had the moment where Jey Uso was going to either acknowledge Roman Reigns and acknowledge the fact that Roman Reigns was going to make him the future tribal chief or go his own way. And we got the bloodline out there. We got Jay, you know, Jay Uso's getting ready to cut the promo. And out comes Jimmy Uso, says, Now, nah, Us, you know, you're my brother. What are you doing? And Jay Uso, what, what main event Jay Uso does better than anybody? Not just main eventing shows, but main eventing the microphone. Main event Jay Uso goes, You know what, Us? You know what? Uh, you know who made me? This man, pointing to Roman Reigns. And you know what? I'm, I'm done. You know what that means? You're out. And then there's this pause, and he's looking, and it looks like they're going to get into it. And all of a sudden, he goes, and I'm out too. And he super kicks the shit out of Roman Reigns. Oh, my God. They then proceed to double super kick Solo Sokoa. And then, if that wasn't enough, the exclamation, the cherry on top, they double super kick Roman Reigns to put that big exclamation pop. Huge pop from the crowd. Huge pop at home. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, you've said it a million times, Kenan. What is this? This is cinema. This is absolute cinema. By the way, I want to point out there's a lot more people saying that. We were saying it here first. I'm not trying to be, sound like an asshole saying that, but go back in the records. We've been saying this is a movie and cinema for this storyline for over a year now. Mm-hmm. And it keeps getting better and better. The performances by Jay Uso. Give him all the awards in the world because the entire setup here has been going back and forth. Will he, won't he? And the minute that he starts cutting that amazing promo talking to Jimmy and saying the reason I'm a main event, the reason we're where we are is because of Roman. And you see Romans just starts laughing just with this, you know, real sinister grin on his face. And then he goes back to him. He says, yeah, you're out. And then I'm out too. pauses just long enough to have the crowd hooked in. And then once he gives him that super kick, this was rivaling. If I can use that word rivaling, (laughs) when Sami Zayn hit Roman with the chair. Oh, absolutely. We've all been waiting for the time that Jey Uso is tired of dealing with Roman Reigns shit, quite frankly. Yeah. Like, and I I know we've been trying, I've been trying to cut down the swearing, but that's the only way to put that one. Oh, exactly. And to Roman's credit, too, selling like it's no tomorrow either. Well, I like the fact that he got back up talking smack to both yeah. of them before eating the second one and then selling that like death. Yeah. And then, of course, if you saw the footage uh, shot from the crowd afterwards of the, uh, the crowd as Roman's getting back up chanting, you deserve it. Yeah. I thought that was amazing because, listen, man, we are in an age where it's cool to be a heel that gets cheered. Mm-hmm. And Roman, you know, he's got the respect. The crowd acknowledges that he's Roman Reigns. But at the end of the day, when the bell sounds, when things go down, we all know that he's a heel. Yeah. And man, it was perfect. I think that there's nothing you could have done better in this storyline. And and like I said, I didn't know where this storyline was going. None of us did. I am pleasantly surprised and happy about everything we see going down. Oh my God. How could you not be? This is what we always say on this show about storylines. If you have something that can connect with the audience and really get that emotional reaction out of them. I mean, sure. Every, everybody pops when it's a great move and you know, moments like that. But this storyline locks you in from the minute the show begins and you see everybody arrive to the arena till right at the very end when they're saying goodbye to everybody on the, on the show. It's just one of those things that nobody else is doing it like them, and they keep getting better. Like That's the craziest thing. After all these years, it's still getting better. Oh, I agree. And here's the best part. We didn't have to wait long to find out what we're going to go with this because it was announced like within hours mm-hmm. of SmackDown. That coming up at Money in the Bank, just uh, as, as we record on this Sunday, it is, well, it was two weeks ago this past Saturday, or the day before we're recording, just the peek behind the curtain. But if you think about that, coming up at Money in the Bank, 
It will be what they're calling the Bloodline Civil War, as the Usos will be in a tag match against Roman Reigns and Solo Sokoa in the Bloodline Civil War. And I'm all for this, but I have heard some complaints on the internet, and I think that we, I think me and you uh, should attack these complaints. Sure. People are saying that, hey, does this really mean that we're not going to get a Roman Reigns title defense from WrestleMania to SummerSlam? And my, my answer to this question is simple. I get it. The belt's a thing. But that's why we created the WWE World Heavyweight title, remember? Mm -hmm. That was going to be the workhorse world title. And so far, Seth Rollins has defended that belt on Raw. He's defended that belt at house shows. He's defending that title at uh, Money in the Bank against Finn Balor, which I'm not going to waste a lot of time talking about. Not that it's a waste of time, but we're obviously because there was a great promo this past week. But we're going to talk about that next week when we preview Money in the Bank. So I think that, you know, giving that its own shine is going to be good. So my point of the matter is that's why we created that belt, correct? If yes. That, that's what we were told. So what is the problem? And I get it. Yeah, we want to see a title defense, but I'd rather see this story play out. You tell me that you would rather Roman be in some title defense that he's going to automatically win at Night of Champions instead of seeing him in solo go against Sammy and KO. You're telling me you would rather see Roman this up, you know, uh, like it was from when we record like roughly what uh, 13 days away from when we were recording right now, something mm -hmm. like that, 12, 13 days. Yeah. You would rather see him in a match where, you know, the person going against him is not going to beat him for the title in money in the bank in London, England at the O2. Then seeing this bloodline storyline play out. Come on, man. This is to me, this is bad faith dealing. Mm -hmm. and I'm, and I, and I, listen, if you have a valid point to this and you're not, you know, get, you know, like rich, I don't like it. I get it. I understand the traditionalists of this, but think about it. This storyline is more entertaining than him having a, t uh, having a world title match that there is zero chance of him losing. Let me ask you this. Okay. We put him in into a title match at money in the bank who right now on the SmackDown roster is on that level that you would be that invested to see him face. Nobody. Because yeah. the only argument you could make would be Drew McIntyre, but he's on Raw. Right. Even though he hasn't been back yet, okay? Mm -hmm. But let's say that you swap up, uh, Drew McIntyre comes on, you know, England. But we've already done that once in England. Mm -hmm. Why go, you know, I understand cheap pop. Why do it? I guess you could say the almighty Bobby Lashley. But once again, Bobby Lashley's not going to win the match. So basically it's filler. Yeah. When we can get a serious storyline that's the hottest storyline in wrestling, mm -hmm. and we can get another chapter, and they can go many ways with this chapter. You know, they can go the route that Roman and Solo win, and through that, for some reason, the Usos come back in the fold. They can go that uh, it's a no contest and gets thrown out, and we just continue the war. Or, and this is what I think might happen, they can go with the fact that Jey Uso will pin Roman Reigns' shoulders to the mat, and it'll be the, he'll be the first man in over three years to beat Roman Reigns, and that will set up a world title fight at SummerSlam between Jey Uso and Roman Reigns, and I completely see that happening. Now, do I think Jey Uso will win at SummerSlam? Probably not. However, that's a match I'm, I'm willing to see, or maybe Jimmy, but I think Jey would be the... Jay is my first pick. Although if they do it with Jimmy, I'm not mad about that either. Great minds think alike because that's where I think they're going to head with this. I think the Usos are going to win outright, and I think Roman gets pinned. And now what I think will be the interesting dynamic is I do think you're on the right path for SummerSlam. It will be Roman versus Jay, but I think Roman will force Jimmy into the match. So, so, so a three-way? Yeah. Just, that's a good way to try, but well, you know what though that's a good way for the tribal chief to still win yes because at one point one of you's got to try to beat the tribal chief and when do you, both of you not want to be champion exactly i get it i like that here's the only thing i'm going to throw in the mix and i would really love to see that would mess that up and by the way this is why this storyline is such a great storyline mm -hmm. when people ask me why i think this storyline is great it's because there's there's so many opportunities we don't know the answer because there's not just one way this could go and it'd be good because I can also see Solo and Roman winning, adding an addition of like a Jacob Fatu yes. into the bloodline, just like I did in my uh, WWE 2K video game. I understand it's a video game, but I have the bloodline tag team of Solo, Sokoa, and, J and, and Jacob Fatu against the Usos in a feud. So if you want to do something like that, now all of a sudden we go from this into back into a tag realm where you have another member of, and it doesn't necessarily have to be Jacob Fatu. I'm just a big Jacob Fatu fan. Mm -hmm. But the Samoan dynasty is large. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, Rakishi did say that he was going to rectify 
whatever this disrespect is going on. He wasn't taking his son's sides necessarily. He was taking the side of the tribal chief. Yeah. So what if Rakishi provides another member of the Samoan des- dynasty to then save the match for Roman and Solo, and then that's where we go with the feud. And it's genius. Once again, there's so many things you can do off of this and that we have done off of this. Mm-hmm. If you don't think, uh, it, just go back in the time to see how many of the things that have come off of this. We've gotten re- two WrestleMania main events in the same year off of it. Yeah. We've got a Night of Champions main event. We're going to Money in the Bank main event. Like, there's so much great stuff coming off this storyline that there's really endless possibilities. And honestly, this is not an indictment of any other company. Sure. This is not an indictment of any other storyline that's going on. This storyline just deserves the respect of being as good as it is. And part of that reason is because we don't know what's going to happen next in the Bloodline storyline because there's so many avenues. Like, literally, you remember when you did those uh, those uh, those brainstorming ideas mm-hmm. and you put the ID, you know, the overall thing in the circle and then have arms come off and then have other circles and more arms? If you look at the storyline from, you know, where it started to now, there is so many bubbles and lines off of this thing that has really spurned a whole, sh- you know, SmackDown really lives and dies off of this Bloodline storyline. Oh, absolutely. Because there's other storylines in SmackDown that are directly responsible, you know, that are directly caused by this storyline. Mm-hmm. I.e., you know, Pretty Deadly's getting a shot at the tag titles. Yes. It, you know, think about it, the tag team champions are champions because of this storyline. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, there's a lot coming off of it. No, this storyline is building stars. If you look at the entire run that has happened... <laughs> Since Roman and Paul got together, they've been building cards. They've been building storylines. They've been building WWE back up. Honestly, they have done no wrong with this storyline. So why would you want to try tampering with it just to have a title defense? Yeah, sure, I get why Roman's champion. But unless you have something of value to this storyline, this it's almost like the storyline is greater than the title right now. And there's nothing wrong with saying that because look at the audience watching. And how many are invested, not only just wrestling fans, but pop culture fans that are tuning in because it's now branching out. It's getting almost to that level of a Stone Cold 316 or an NWO. You remember when it used to be all over the place. It's getting there to now you're seeing more people tune in and more people starting to acknowledge it. This is why the storyline is working so well. So why tamper with it? Just for a throwaway match. I mean, in all honesty, there's no story build behind it. And there's no reason Roman would do an open challenge at this stage. Right, I agree. So I, I have no problem with that not being online. Uh, real quick, because like I said, I, I don't want to run from like some things, but obviously next week we will be doing, in the main event, doing the whole uh, Money in the Bank breakdown. Right. So, uh, But I will say this here. Uh, the two things that are coming out for Money in the Bank that I do want to just kind of touch on briefly, I don't want to dive too far into, because obviously next week, uh, of course, Finn Balor versus Seth Rollins for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. I love the match. You want to call it the workhorse belt? Is there two better workers in that match? Absolutely I love it. not. And on top of yeah. lo- and on top of loving, I love the story that's going into it. I mean, Seth dropped the line. Is is it going to be the same guy that I faced last time? And of course, if you remember, the demon Finn Balor is who fought him for the universal title, or is it just going to be Finn Balor? Uh, so I like the tease. I don't know if it's going to. I'm I'm assuming it's going to be regular Finn Balor. But once again, I like the tease. I think it's good. And on top of that, I love the promo that Finn cut. And I understand that people are complaining about people cheering for Rollins and doing the music. Guess what? That means he's effing over. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, that means he's legit effing over. Yep. I'm not taking that away. Then then, then do what every good heel does. And that's what Finn did. Talk smack to the crowd. Mm Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the other one, the 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 real dark cloud in the room that people I seem to talk smack about. Cody Rhodes versus Dominic Mysterio at Money in the Bank. Listen, I'm glad that they're not putting Cody in the Money in the Bank because mm-hmm. I don't need him winning Money in the Bank. Agreed. He's going to go in there with the guy who has more heat than anybody in the business. Listen, as two guys who were on record of not liking Dominic Mysterio, yep, I am now respecting what Dominic Mysterio does. Same. I do want I, I did listen to the ODPH because you know I listen every week. Mm. I do want to take the time to say I did, do disagree with one point. I think his in ring work has gotten better. And here's the thing: I also think that part of the the bad part of it, I think, is on purpose. I think at this point in juncture for Heat, he wants to make it look like he's terrible in the ring. Cause really? If, yeah, because if you think about it, it works for Heat. So what he does is he's hiding when he when he messes up. He's hiding behind Rhea Ripley. He's hiding behind uh, Damian Priest. He's hiding behind Finn Balor, and it makes it look like he's a uh, like sniveling. No, no, do, does no good. If you go back to his WrestleMania match with his dad, 
where a lot of that match was one on one. There was some interference, but if you remember, most mm-hmm. of that match was one on one. He did a great job of selling and working. So I think he can actually work matches now. Maybe not. I don't think he's the best. Right, right, and right. I think he's better than what he was. But I think that a lot of what he's doing is on purpose and it's getting heat. Because think about it. Every time he gets in trouble and he goes, Mommy, help me. Yeah. It gets what? The crowd to react. The kid is doing all the right things to get the crowd to react. Uh, Listen, as somebody who did not like him, to now go, dude, he has somehow gone from being hated in legit nuclear go-away heat, if you will, Mm -hmm. to now legit like heel heat. Like the crowd is giving him legit. I don't care what people say. It's go-away. It's not go-away heat. The crowd is is playing into him. Yeah. Think of it. And he's working the crowd. Because we talked about that a couple weeks ago. He got the mic, and he he every time the crowd would die down for the booze, he would say something on purpose to get them going back up. As I was saying, what's got the crowd to boo again? That- oh, don't you interrupt me. Got the crowd to boo again. And I think he's doing that in the ring as well. I'm not saying that he is a legend in the ring. No, yet, no, no. I get you. But if you watched his match against Ray at WrestleMania, go back and watch it. He worked a pretty good match there. So I think, and that was mostly what I won. There was some interference, but most of the time when he's in the ring, he's got Rhea outside. He's got, you know, cause usually mommy comes to the ring with him. Mm-hmm. So think about it. When he gets in trouble, don't hit me. Uncle edge. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of it is actually him working the crowd during the match. That's, because that's, in- that's interesting. A wise man once told me when I was working in the business and actually being broken in and learning about the psychology of wrestling, that the best heel heat comes from doing nothing. So when a heel comes out and like they act like they can't wrestle, what does the crowd do? The crowd goes, you can't wrestle. You suck. Ah! And they get on the person's ass. And so you should do it more. Like the art form of like standing on somebody's neck. Like Big Show. Mm-hmm. Perfect example. Big Show was always good at getting that heel heat. Like he do, you know. But we saw Big Show work an athletic, you know, match. Yeah. We've seen him do it. But then when he was a heel, he would just like stand on the guy on the rope. Yeah. He would he would lean on the guy. You know, like in the crowd would be like, You suck, you can't wrestle. Think about it. It's that, good heat. That's an interesting perspective. I mean, I could be wrong, yeah, but I right. think, but it, with the evidence of WrestleMania as being that he worked a hell of a match and one of the best matches of the weekend on a stacked weekend. Oh, I'll give you that. I, I thought you had his best in ring match ever. Right. That but, we've seen him. But, but yeah. think about it. That kid can pull that if he can pull it off in that match, he can pull it off any time. It's a choice, and it's a good choice because he wants the heat. I'll have to really start paying attention when he's in the ring next time to see this. Because, like I say, that's an, that's a really fascinating perspective. And also, I, I like the, the little thing that you should look for is when he gets in trouble in a match. Like a lot of times, he'll get he'll get over like Rio help him or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then he'll gloat, and then the guy will make the comeback because while he's gloating, he doesn't like pay attention. That's all intentional. Yeah. Well, I, I really, I really think that I, I think that people aren't giving him the credit that he deserves. And I'm not saying that he's once again, I'm not saying that he's Seth Rollins. In the right, right, right. But he doesn't have to be. No, I mean, his in, like I say, his in, his in ring time on the microphone has gotten light years better. And he does these, the mannerisms for his age to pick up on the crowd is really remarkable. I will give him that. The the question about the in ring work that I gotta really pay attention to that now. Yeah, I think I think everybody should, and I, I just wanted to throw that out there. Here's the other thing I will say: he's kind of reminds me, and, and this is an, in a heel way. He reminds me of uh, Toriano. Oh, Toriano can wrestle. We've seen him wrestle, right, right. But it's more about the spectacle. It's more about the entertainment. Interesting. And I think that I think he's really going into that book. And I think if that's the case. Dude, sky's the limit for one Dominic Mysterio. Uh, so I just want to touch on that when people were crapping on it, like why? Because he's the best. He, I shouldn't say best heel. He's a really good, effective heel. And Cody's your really over face. So that that match makes sense to me. Oh, yeah. Especially because Brock is going to help Cody. Let's win. be honest. I, yeah. we'll, we'll talk about it next week and go more in depth. But I'm with you 100%. Brock Lesnar is going to cost Cody Rhodes the match. Dominic Mysterio is going to get the win. Which for him, for heel heat, is going to be amazing. Oh, that he's gonna crowd go on, is going to explode. But ready for this? He's going to go on TV on Monday night and go, I beat Cody Rhodes. I beat your hero. And I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't parlay that into a title match against Seth Rollins. And then we'll have some fun with it. You see you, what I mean? I, you know what? I I now need to see a celebration party in the ring. And I really actually yeah. really enjoy seeing a Seth Rollins versus Dominic match. Not that I, the kid's got a chance in hell of winning the belt. But here, let me riddle you this. You make that match, Damian Priest wins money in the bank. Yeah. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, things are looking a little different, aren't they? You Very know, much. I think Damian Priest might win money in the bank. I don't think he's going to cash in on the same night, but then there'll be that threat that he could cash in on Finn. But then think about it. If Dom's got the match against Seth at some point, hmm, it's a perfect opportunity for a, a Damian Priest to cash in. 
A lot of possibilities. With I mean, the there's Judgment a ton Day. of stuff. There's yeah. a ton of stuff going on. Once again, Judgment Day. Listen, just as layered as as Bloodline. Maybe not as good, but we'll give it some time. Bloodline's been going on for over two years. Mm-hmm. That's why it's as as good as it is. But and there's a lot of layers to Judgment Day right now. The J D. McDonough yeah, stuff. Say. The Damian Priest stuff. Finn Balor. Dominic, obviously Rhea. Like, there's a lot going on, and I can't wait to see more of that. So WWE is really hitting their strides on storytelling on both shows. But, uh, Ken, before we clock out of the uh, first opening segment here of 607 TWS this week, I do believe there has been an announcement by World Wrestling Entertainment that you would like to share with the fine folks here at 607 TWS. Yes, uh, coming right from WWE's uh, offices to us, and thank you very much for sending it over. Pittsburgh is going to be hosting WWE Payback on September 2nd. So quoting the press release sent to us, uh, WWE Payback will be taking place Saturday, September 2nd from the PPG Paints Arena in Pittsburgh. It marks the first premium live event to emanate from Pittsburgh in five years. So WWE Payback will be streaming live exclusively on Peacock in the U.S. and WWE Network everywhere else. Tickets are going to go on sale June 27th. More information, WWE.com. That's right. If you're in the Pittsburgh area, get those tickets. It's I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to sell out. Pittsburgh is a hell of a wrestling town. Oh, yeah. can't believe it's been five years since they've had a live uh, premium live event there. But I think it's going to be a big event. So get those tickets in the Pittsburgh area. You never know who might even stop in. I'm just going to throw that out there. With that being said, Ken M. That's going to do it for the opening segment. We're going to take our first break. When we come back, we're going to hit you with the mid card, which features the indie roundup. We're talking Game Changer Wrestling. Absolute Intense Wrestling, and of course, Pro Wrestling Revolver. We got reviews, we got previews, all that and more when we come back from this break. It is time for the mid card of this week's 607 TWS. Of course, Ken M is bringing us in on that great baseline. That's right. Get it, brother. Yeah. Of course. As always, the mid card of 607 TWS is brought to you by Fight.TV. More specifically, Fight Plus. Of course, for $7.99 a month, you get a ton of great pro wrestling, indie pro wrestling, I should say action and of course those are from groups like game changer wrestling aiw and pro wrestling revolver which we'll be talking about this week plus glory pro live on top of all of that you get black label pro house of glory and so much more and more things getting added all the time not only do you get live events you get archive events and you get free replays all the time because 7.99 a month i think it's the best deal in wrestling ken m how do you feel about fight plus no lies detected it is the best deal for independent pro wrestling and combat sports in general, seven ninety nine a month is not bad, to say the least, for all the content you get. And it doesn't matter if you're a wrestling fan, boxing fan, combat sports. If you are in that genre and that is your niche, they have something for you. And you can't say, well, I can't find anything I don't like here or I like here. They have something for everybody on this platform. And it rolls over to even more events, too. Absolutely. So thank you, Fight Plus. Go check them out. $7.99 a month. You will not regret it. Let's talk about three huge shows that went down this past Saturday as we record. Of course, all of them going down on uh, June the 17th. All of them on Saturday, like I said before, starting off with the one that went first, and that would be AIW Absolute Intense Wrestling Presents Over the Line from the West Side Bowl in Youngstown, Ohio. Let's talk about it. The opening contest, Jocelyn Navarro defeated Holly Dead, 13 minutes and 12 seconds. Holly Dead short, 
replacement. Yes. Literally, same day replacement. Unfortunately, uh, the person who was booked originally couldn't make it, but Holly did. I think that's a very good replacement. Oh, absolutely. Congratulations to Jocelyn Navarro for a big victory there. The Duke, your Haas Division champion, retains that golden boot as he defeated Arthur MacArthur, 11 minutes and 43 seconds. Kaplan defeated Hardway, Holloway, uh, Marino, and Vic Vice, 11 minutes and 24 ma- seconds into a awesome four-way match. Mm-hmm. I thought this was very good. Next up, Dominic Garini defeated Logan Easton LaRue, 13 minutes and 11 seconds. PB Smooth took down the young up-and-comer Shaw Mason in 7 minutes and 23 seconds. Isaiah Bronner's on his way to get that yeah. title shot at Absolution. He destroyed Philly Collins at 8 minutes and 17 seconds. Hey, not a bad idea to take out Cardona's boys, right? Exactly. Next up for the AIW Tag Team Champions, your champions money shot, Elijah Dean and Zach Nystrom took on the Rip City Shooters, Joshua Bishop and Wes Barkley, our homies. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, 11 minutes and 53 seconds and still your AIW Tag Team Champions money shot. But we have a surprise contender for their show coming up this week. We'll save that as a little tease until we preview the show. Next up, Chase Oliver, the hometown boy, defeated Lewis Linden via DQ, 3 minutes and 43 seconds. But that's not the real story because after the DQ loss, uh, because Jack Vervel, who's also in 9-5 to five with Lewis Linden, who was not supposed to be there, all of a sudden was there. Who made the save? Carlito. Yeah. So we got an impromptu tag match where Carlito and Chase Oliver defeated 9 to 5, 15 minutes and 2 seconds. And after the match, mm. Carlito confirmed he is returning to World Wrestling Entertainment. That was a rumor going around. Now it has been confirmed that Carlito will be returning to WWE. Thoughts on the show? Thoughts on the return of Carlito? Excellent show as always. They're putting out some great work there. And for Carlito coming back, whew, like how. How big of a move is that for WWE? And especially coming off the heels of the reaction he got at Backlash, this is going to be a big move for them, and I can't wait to see where he winds up. I I could see him going on Monday Night Raw. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Or joining up with the LWO over on Smack Dizzles. Yeah, that could happen too. So it's one of the two, but I can see him either way. He's a good utility player. looks like a million bucks. I think he's ready to be in there. Can't wait to see more Carlito. Let's go on to the next show because Pro Wrestling Revolver had a huge show from the Cole May Center at Montgomery County Fairgrounds in Dayton, Ohio. They presented in the Ring of Destiny. And by the way, this was their biggest attendance ever in that building. And they go back to, the, they're in Cole May uh, all the time. A lot, yeah. And this is their biggest attendance. If you saw the, the if you saw it, if you need to see it, check it out. There was people everywhere. Yeah. This was a true standing room only show. Good for Pro Wrestling Revolver, who put on an amazing show. Let's talk about the card. In the opening contest, the Callahan Death Machine. Sammy Callahan defeated JT Dunn in 4 minutes and 57 seconds. This was an impromptu match. JT Dunn thought he was going to get a cheap victory over some jabroni from the back. Instead, he got the boss, and the boss took him out. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Next up. The unit tag team of Ali Catch and Logan James defeated the Brat Pack. Billy Starks and Brogan Finley, 8 minutes and 21 seconds. Good match. Uh, Ali Catch, one of the best in the world. But, hey, give it up for the Brat Pack. Those two young kids doing good things. Absolutely. Next, Allen Angels defeated Robert Martyr, 6 minutes and 53 seconds. This was a hard-hitting match. I like the fact that Allen Angels is really trying to put a name back out there. We see him in Impact doing good work, but we're also seeing him in Revolver doing amazing work. And Prestige as well. Yeah, this might have been my sleeper match of the week. Next up in an unlucky 13 staple gun match. That's right. You heard it right. <laughs> Alice Cologne defeated Crazy King 13 minutes and 7 seconds. This was not for the squeamish. Good to see Alex Cologne back in the ring. Good to see uh, Crazy King back in the yeah. ring as well because uh, we've gotten to see a little bit of him in GCW and now seeing him in Pro Wrestling Revolver. Hopefully we get to see him again. Golden Ticket Gauntlet match would be up next. Damian Chambers is your winner. 19 minutes and 59 seconds, by the way. Uh, there was one huge surprise in this match. Shark Boy was in the mm. gauntlet. Uh, great gauntlet match. Loved it. Damian Chambers is going to get a shot at the title. Next up, tag team match. The Motor City Machine Guns, Alex Shelley and Chris Saban defeated ABC in 15 minutes and 24 seconds. And by the way, they used every tactic they could to beat ABC. They used belts. Mm -hmm. They used uh, the ending came after like four or five punches to the dick. Uh, So listen, in Pro Wrestling Revolver, the Motor City Machine Guns are heels and they're loving it. (laughs) Oh, yeah. This was a great match. The Revolver World title was on the line. Next, your champion, Steve Macklin, going against the Firestarter, Jake Chris. And this match got 13 minutes and 6 seconds. And at the end of the day, your new 
Pro Wrestling Revolver World Champion, the Firestarter, Jake Christ. Phenomenal match. An awesome moment to see, too. And it's time for the main event of the evening. Eight-man tag team extravaganza. At the end of the day, the second gear crew, one call Manders, Mance Warner, and the returning Matthew Justice with their special guest uh, for the evening tag partner, the one and only John Moxley yeah. defeated the Rascals, Myron Reed, Trey Miguel, Zachary Wentz, and their, for the night, tag partner, Ricky Shane Page, 16 minutes, 57 seconds. Great match, and I'll tell you what, Moxley and SGC, they go together like peanut butter and jelly. I was going to say, Moxley looked very, very comfortable with SGC, more so than the BCC, in my opinion. Yeah, he was right at home, and uh, I, I'm scared if they uh, go on a run. Because that could be a run yeah. you don't stop. That could be a run you don't stop. Ladies and gentlemen, that wasn't it for Saturday, though, because the la- to end it out, because it was 11 p.m. Eastern, of course. It was a Pacific Time show. 11 p.m. Eastern. Game Changer Wrestling presents Thank Me Later from the Ukrainian Cultural Center in Los Angeles, California. Let's talk about Starboy Charlie defeated Cole Raderick in the opening contest, 9 minutes and 28 seconds. Kevin Knight defeated the East Coast Beast, Alec Price, in 10 minutes and 12 seconds. Both those matches were tremendous. Yes. Actually, there's not a match on this card that wasn't great. Right. Let's throw that out there. Uh, Joey Janela and Sawyer Rec defeated the former GCW World Tag Team Champions, Los Macisos, Ciclope and Miedo Extremo, in 11 minutes and 40 seconds. Now, we had uh, some shuffling of the deck. Mm-hmm. Uh, the world champion, Blake Christian, could not make it into uh, town because of reasons. Right. Never given, but there was reasons. And there was a couple other people who couldn't make it. So we had one of these first matches. Santana Jackson defeated former child star Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy F. and Lloyd in five minutes and 59 seconds. If you're not familiar with Santana Jackson, that is the young man who does the Michael Jackson Mm -hmm. uh, gimmick. Yes. (laughs) And it was a really entertaining match. Uh, There was some people on the internet that wanted to point out the irony of the Michael Jackson impersonator taking on the only child star in GCW. (laughs) Uh, We'll leave that one alone. Next up, there was a three-way match. uh, Jack Cartwheel defeated Kevin Blackwood and Titus Alexander in 16 minutes and 49 seconds. Unfortunately, Kevin Blackwood was supposed to get the title shot. That will be made up to him, uh, promised by Brett Lauderdale at a future date. Yeah. Next up, in probably the match of the night, possibly my match of the weekend, Rina Yamashita, your reigning uh, tournament of survival winner and your GCW ultra-violent champion, defeated Maki Ito, 17 minutes, 37 seconds, and oh, God. First of all, not for the week at heart. No. <laughs> but Maki, Maki death kill for sure. Holy crap. This I, match. I think even Reno was surprised about the yeah. lights that Maki Ito was willing to go. I need to see this ran back, but I need time to prep for it. Like, it was just that mind-blowing. I think both of these ladies need time to recover from it. Yeah. <laughs> but tremendous match. Everybody's giving it rave reviews. Maki Ito, man, proving that uh, the future match with her and Nick Gage taking on Steph DeLander and uh, Matt Cardona in a death match, allegedly. Yeah. Uh, could be very bad for them. Oh, my God. Like, it's <laughs> going to be insane. They call themselves the death match king and queen, talking about Cardona and DeLander. Uh, the real death match king and queen might be Nick Gage and Maki Ito. Yeah. Speaking of uh, Nick Gage, we'll talk about him in a minute. But first, before then... Effie, that's right, Daddy, defeated Kenny King, 11 minutes, 18 seconds. I thought this was a really good match for Effie, showing a different style. Mm -hmm. Kenny King is amazing, and he has been for quite some time. I don't understand why he is not signed to somewhere bigger. I understand he's with Impact, but they're not using him a lot. I would have liked to see him in a bigger role, maybe a WWE, AEW, in a real spot. But once again, I get a lot of people out there. But Kenny King, man. There's not many better. No, I, I fully agree with you. I thought this was a fantastic match. And, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised he's not on a bigger stage right now. And in the main event of the evening, your New Japan World Television Champion, Zack Sabre Jr., defeated the man, the king, the effing god of this shit, Nick effing Gage, 14 minutes, 59 seconds. And I'll tell you what, after the match... Zack Saber Jr. got on the phone, uh, got on the microphone. I almost said phone. Yeah. Got on the microphone and stated, "Listen, Nick Gage is a legend. Like you guys don't take for granted the fact that you have a legend that wrestles here. He is one of the greatest wrestlers to ever do it. He's like, I don't care what people say about him doing death matches. That that's irrelevant. He's a mm-hmm. legend. I thought that was really classy and nice of Zack Saber Jr. who didn't have to say that. And he had a hell of a match, including Zack Saber Jr. wrestling in thumbtacks. Yeah, I was gonna say this match." When I first heard it announced, I had no idea what to expect, and I had high hopes, and it fully exceeded it. I really enjoyed this match top to bottom. It went some places I was not expecting, 
And obviously, how Saber put uh, Nick over at the end. Oh, what a classy moment. Very good. And man, Zach Saber Jr. gets a lot of stuff because, you know, his gimmick is he's kind of an asshole. Yeah. And you know what, though? You can tell at the end of the day it's just a gimmick. He's very giving. What a wrestler. Yeah. Dude, when, you, when people ask me about the best wrestlers in the world, Zach Saber Jr., like currently wrestling, Zach Saber Jr. is always up there. And there's time for him to be one of the greatest of all times. Oh, absolutely. The technical wizard and beyond. Uh -huh. Let's just throw that out there. I know that there's some people who think his style is boring because he's a technical wrestler, but I don't think it's boring. I think it's amazing. Oh, it's ingenious, the stuff he pulls off and how he does it so fluidly. Like, that's the one thing. We're, we're so used to seeing the hardcore style so much. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we're... We don't build up to moves and really try showcasing it like much in the same vein of like when Dean Malenko was in his prime and, oh, really, and, and going that route. So to see Zack Sabre Jr. do it now, and he still has a lot of years left in this business, and he's getting better each time we see him, it's going to be something truly remarkable when he finally you know really connects with the fans like that and gets on such a big stage and really showcases what he can do. Because like I say, I never see a match of his and say it's boring. I always think it's like innovative, like much in the same vein with talking MMA with Demetrius Johnson. Oh, absolutely. I, I will also say this. I think that he's in that old school vein of like your Nick Bockwinkles, Bret Hart's yeah. excellence of execution. Obviously, Lance Storm, Dean Malenko. That's the kind of category he's in. And he's, but I think he's more exciting than a lot of those guys because the way that he does things, next level. There's some mission holes and not tying that he does to people that I didn't even think is possible. Yeah. So if you've never seen Zack Sabre Jr., Please check him out. Of course, he's going to be at Forbidden Door. We're going to talk about that in the main event segment. So let's talk about things going down this upcoming weekend. And uh, GCW has three shows coming at you, one on Friday, one on Saturday, one on Sunday. So we're going to start there. And then there's a couple other promotions also on Fight Plus. All of these shows, once again, Fight Plus $7.99. If you can't watch them live, that's okay because you get the free replays. So let's start off with the first show going down on June 23rd, Friday, June 23rd. By the way, this was really weird to be 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hmm? And it's not a West Coast show. However, keep your eyes on fight. That might change. I, I'm literally taking that from fight. Okay. and Because it's coming to you from Chicago. Uh, at, from Thalia Hall in Chicago, Illinois. So 11 p.m. sounds like a late start time. Maybe it's because of all the other wrestling shows. Because I do know that uh, there's some other shows. Obviously, SmackDown doesn't end until then. And then Rampage ends at 11. I don't know if that's why they're doing it. I have no clue. But anyways, that's what it says now. That could change. Okay. Ready to hear the card? Yeah, let's do it. Commander versus the East Coast States, Jordan Oliver. Ooh, that's going to be good. In a six-man tag team extravaganza, Los Macisos, Ciclope, and Miedo Extremo, tag with the reigning TOS winner and your GCW ultra-violent champion, Rina Yamasha, to take on the second gear crew, One Call Manders and Mance Warner, and they're tagging with John Wayne Murdoch, the Duke of Hardcore. Ooh, ho, ho, That's going to be a good one. Yeah. Next up, Joey Janela and Sawyer Wreck go uh, in a tag match against Bussy, Ali Catch, and Effie. Oh, that's going to be great. Up next, Steph DeLander wants to call herself the uh, queen of death matches, right? Mm. Well, she'll get to prove it because she gets to go up against Independent Wrestling Hall of Famer Lufisto. Oh, let's go. Next up, Metalik returns to Game Changer Wrestling, and he's going to go one-on-one -on -one with the AAA Mega Champion, El Hijo Del Vikingo. That's going to be phenomenal. That could be match of the weekend. Yeah. However, though, the main event of this evening for the Game Changer Wrestling World's Championship, your champion, all heart, Blake Christian, defending against Chicago's own Gringo Loco. Oh, that's going to be, that could be match of the weekend. Easy. Oh, uh, definitely. Easy. Well, Game Changer Wrestling is back on Saturday, June 24th. This is a more respectable 8 p.m. Eastern start time, just so yeah. everybody knows. Uh, and this is coming to you from Huntsville, Alabama, at the Von Buren Center. And it's GCW Presents Mastermind. Uh, matches announced so far. Cole Roderick, the king of wreck shit mountain, goes one-on-one -on -one with Hunter Drake. Okay. Tank goes one-on-one -on -one with the bad boy Joey Janela. Ooh. The Duke of Hardcore, John Wayne Murdoch, goes one-on-one -on -one with Sawyer Wreck. Oh, all right, let's go. Your reigning TOS winner and your GCW Ultra Violent Champion, Rena Yamasha, goes one on one with Daddy Effie. Okay. And in the main event of the evening for the Game Changer Wrestling World Championship, presuming he is still champion, your champion, All Heart Blake Christian, goes one on one with Adam Priest. Ooh. That is going to be a salad match right there. Ooh, folks. that's going to be real good. 
We're not done yet. GCW is back, of course, on Sunday, uh, June 25th at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time from Florence, Alabama at the Singing River Brewing Company presenting GCW versus New South 2. So New South Wrestling is, of course, a co-promotion here. And all these matches take place between a New South wrestler and a GCW wrestler or wrestlers. So let's talk about Starboy Charlie representing GCW takes on Tyler Franks representing New South. Okay. In a tag team match, rep or well, technically this is a six man tag, although they have it listed as a tag team match. Representing Game Changer Wrestling, the Duke of Hardcore, John Wayne Murdoch, teams up with Los Macisos for the second time this weekend. See, uh, Ciclope and Miedo Extremo to take on representing New South, Akuto Death Society, Chris Crunk, Kevin Ryan, and Braden Toon. Hmm. Representing Game Changer Wrestling, the East Coast Beast, Alec Price. Goes one-on-one representing New South, Hunter Drake. That's going to be a great match. That's going to be a real good match. Representing New South, Dylan McQueen goes one-on-one with Game Changer Wrestling's daddy, Effie. Okay. Next up in a tag team extravaganza, we're getting the women involved here. Your Game Changer Wrestling ultra-violent champion, TOS winner, Rena Yamashe, is tagging with Sawyer Wreck representing GCW to take on the New South team of Kenzie Page and Kylie Alexa. Okay. And in the main event of the evening... Granted that he is still the Game Changer Wrestling World Champion, that title will be on the line as your champion, All Heart Blake Christian, will go one-on-one with Brandon Williams. Ooh, okay. That's a good match. That's a very good match. That is a good match. I'm uh, I'm looking forward to even the last time GCW versus New South. This is the second time it was it's a very good show. Very good show. So don't sleep on this one. This will be on plenty of time to watch this before you watch Forbidden Door. That's not all that's going down on Fight Plus because AIW's got a show on Friday, June the 23rd at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time from the Temple Live Asylum Room in Cleveland, Ohio. AIW presents Bow Down. Here's the matches they have listed so far. For the AIW Tag Team Championships, your champion, Money Shot, Elijah Dean and Zach Nystrom. Guess what? Remember when I said there's a surprise that went down? They're going to take on the former AIW World Tag Team Champions, the Bitcoin Boys. That's right. Eric Taylor is back. Him and Mikey Montgomery are going to go for the gold. Ooh, let's go. We have a dream tag team match. You know, pick your partner, dream partner match. Derek Dillinger in a dream partner taking on Wes Barkley in a dream partner. Okay. Nobody's listed yet. We have a great four-way women's match where Ziggy Heim will take on Katie Arquette, take on Jocelyn Navarro, and last but not least, Becca. Let's That's go. going to be a hell of a women's That's going to be a very solid match. And last but not least, in a hardcore match, Kaplan goes one-on-one with the legendary Barbarian. Oh, jeez. Yes, the Barbarian and Kaplan. Can you believe that's going to happen in 2023? No. Can you believe that that's, that's a match? No, I... 2023, folks. Dude, 2023 has brought us a lot of joy. It's brought us a lot of crazy stuff. I am not mad about any of that, just so you know. I agree. I'm not mad I about agree. any of that. But I have to talk about one more show, Ken M. Okay. And this is going to surprise you. The opening part's going to surprise you. Are you ready for to be surprised? I'm, yeah, I'm ready. Are you ready? Yeah. Going down on Saturday, June 24th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's the surprising part. Glory Pro Wrestling presents Locked Up. Interesting. Glory Pro on a Saturday night. Yeah, I was going to say, usually they go Sunday afternoons. That's correct. That is correct. And, of course, they will be coming to you from the Del Mar Hall in St. Louis, Missouri. And they got a full lineup. Are you ready to talk about this? Always ready to talk Glory Pro. All right. First of all, we have Hendricks and Ma- uh, we have Mike Outlaw and Raheem De La Soul tagging up to take on Chris Hendricks and Mason St. Goods. That's going to be a really good match. We have a four-way extravaganza as ATM versus Big Munch versus Crash Jackson versus uh, Storm Grayson. The Big Hoss division is in full effect down in Glory Pro. Oh, yeah. Next on our list, we have Hustle in the Muscle versus Ethan Price and Moses. Really? That's going to be a good match. That's been building for a while. I was going to say. Hustle and Muscle have been in Ethan Price's business. Yeah. We're going to get to see that taken care of. Xavier Walker's going one-on-one with Kenny Alfonso. That's going to be a really good match. 2D Lynn takes on Blair Onyx. That's going to be a great that match. That could be match of the card right Glory, there. Glory, Glory Pro putting on some great women's wrestling there. Yes, absolutely. Oh, this is a match that is, it's, it pains me because I love both these guys. Jake something goes one-on-one with Dan the Dad. Oh. 
Poor Dan the dad. Yeah, I was going to say this is going to be Jake all day. The United Glory Championship will be on the line as your... By the way, that's the tag team titles, if uh, you didn't know. Right. As your champions, PME, the Philly Marino Experience, take on the best bros. Ooh. That's going to be a good match. That's going to be a really solid match. Your Crown of Glory Championship, which is the big title in uh, Glory Pro, if you're not, right. if you don't know. Uh, your champion, Kamaro Jackson, is going to defend against the big man, Calvin Tankman. Ooh. That belt could be in jeopardy is all I'm saying. Yeah, I was going to say, this is going to be a real test for the quad father. And last but not least, and what I'm assuming is the main event of the evening, because this is why it's called Locked Up in a Steel Cage. Cody Lane goes one-on-one with Warhorse. Oh, shh. If Yo. you can't get along, you must get it on inside of the cage. That's coming to you Saturday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Fight Plus Glory Pro Live. Like I said, are you? A, it's amazing. A Saturday night event for Glory Pro. I knew they had a show coming up this weekend. I didn't think it was at 8 o'clock, though. I thought they were going to do it another time. But, man, I'm excited for this. Glory Pro, if you haven't checked them out, seriously, one of the best indies going right now. Listen, man, Fight Plus, all that great action, seven ninety nine a month. Thank you for sponsoring. And also, that is going to do it for the mid-card for this week's 607 TWS. We're going to take our final break. When we come back, it'll be time for the main event segment of this week's episode. And we're going to talk about previewing Forbidden Door. But we're also going to talk about the first episode of Collision, the return of CM Punk, and a ton of other All Elite news going into Forbidden Door and beyond right after this final break. You look at me and you look divine And you've been stuck inside my mind All night Well, I want to be a good I want to be a dog Wrestling fans, are you ready? Uh, let's get ready to rumble! That's right, it's time to rumble. It is time for the main event of this week's episode of 607 TWS. And there's a huge week going down for our friends over at All Elite Wrestling because... We're going to be previewing coming up this Sunday, Forbidden Door. But before we get there, we have to talk about something that happened this past week. And well, a couple of big things. First of all, let's talk about the build to AEW, the first ever episode of AEW Collision. Mm-hmm. We'll give our thoughts on the show. We're not going to go through the whole show, but we'll give our thoughts on the show as a whole. But before we can do all of that, and that's all tied in together, we got to talk about the return of one CM Punk. And of course, uh, the internet had a little, the, the dirt sheets on the internet had a little bit of an explosion because they were just talking about how DEFCON 5 was hit for AEW because there's an ESPN interview with CM Punk that's going to come out that, oh my God, it could, it's just going to put more fires out, you know, put more, burn more things down than what's going on in Canada right now. Uh, and once again, we are with our Canadian friends as these uh, wildfires still continue there. So, you know, send support and love up to Canada. Mm-hmm. But man, they're looking for uh, CM Punk to be the cause of it all. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I don't think it was that egregious. No, I don't think it was either. I thought he, well, I thought he had a lot to say with it, but I didn't think anything was like super explosive. Let me, we're not going to quote anything from it. We're just going to paraphrase, but you can go check it out. And there's nothing that I'm saying that's out of the ordinary, out of line. Uh, I think the most salacious thing he says is he talked about going into the whole thing with Hangman Page. Yes. He said, you know, he shot at me in an interview. He didn't, we didn't talk about it in the back. Uh, in the back, when we were going to go promo, he said different things. We got in the ring. He cuts the promo. And when we get to the back, I'm like, that's unprofessional. That's a real shit thing to do. He was like, so going into our match, I was already kind of on my heels going, all right, 
Is this guy going to try to take advantage of me? Mm. Is this guy going to try to hurt me? Is this guy not going to work? He's not going to cooperate. He's not going to get, you know, when it comes time to do the job, is he not going to do the job? You know, there, he's like, I had, so the match, he was like, in my opinion, that match was terrible. And the reason why, and I'll put it on myself, and this is me talking this punk, obviously. He said, the reason why I put it on myself is because I had a lot going through my mind. And he goes, there's a point in juncture in this match where, in the match where Hangman chops me right to the mouth. Mm-hmm. And he's like, at that point, I had to decide, is this real? Is he shooting on me? Is he trying? to hurt me and you know it kind of reassured my in my head that this is not going well so basically there if you wonder why that match was a little sloppy that's why he was like i'm not blaming that on the buckshot lariats i tried i just can't do it i'm never trying to get so i'd like to he was at least honest there uh so and there's people on the internet obviously defending hangman adam page and saying about well he helped him up after the buckshots and all that stuff here's the thing i i somebody put it out the video watch the video of the the mouth chop that, listen, and this is not against Hangman Page. I don't know him. Mm-hmm. I don't know CM Punk personally. I do know, you know, we can talk all day about his, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? His aura. Yes. His legacy, whether that's in the ring or out of the ring. But at the end of the day, that none of that matters. When you watch that video, he, Hangman measures up a chop to the chest. And somehow, instead of going across like he measured, he goes from Florida to Maine, as my good friend Slick Wagner Brown would say, and does cuff him right in the mouth. Yeah. I think that that was intentional. I don't know if he was trying. Obviously, I don't think he was trying to hurt him. But I do think he was letting Punk know that anytime I want to I want to punch you in the mouth, I will. And I don't know, once again, if I'm P- CM Punk, that's not a place you want to be. That's kind of hostile. Yeah, I have to agree with you on that. Like, watching the videotape after hearing uh, reading the interview, he, where there's smoke, there's fire, in my opinion. And especially at this level, you don't really misdirect on that level, if you're going straight across with the chop, you don't go 45 degrees up. Yeah. I'm sorry, you just don't. So I could understand where Punk is coming from, and right. especially on such a high profile match at the time, that's really unacceptable. I would argue it's their biggest main event of the, at the time. Oh, at the time, C- yeah, CM absolutely. Punk, absolutely. Who made his return to a thunderous return, ra- boosted the ratings, maybe not through the roof like most, some, most of us thought, myself and yourself yep. included, but still boosted the ratings. And here you are for the world title for the first time. You have some little issue during a promo. I get where that could be in your head. And then you have smacked in your mouth. Whether it's intentional or not, it looked intentional to me. Yeah. I'm not saying it was. Hangman's not commenting on it, so therefore I don't know. I do know the Young Bucks, after uh, hearing that, uh, Nick Jackson in particular, put up a thing about how uh, Hangman's the most uh, stand-up, honest guy they know and hardworking guy they know. So obviously, you know. It is what it is. And we're going to get to that in a minute because I, I just want to just throw that one out there. Mm-hmm. Next up, let's talk about Brawl Out because he, he mentions Brawl Out. And he doesn't go in. He said, I'm not going to go into details. I'm not going to go in. I regret what the things that happened. But at the time, I was hurt. I was frustrated. And I let it out. And I have apologized to Tony Khan because I shouldn't have put him in that position. That was very unprofessional of me. And so I have apologized to him for it. As far as the other guys involved, I have tried to reach out to them numerous times. That has not been reciprocated. As a matter of fact, I've even recently tried to call them. Anytime I try to call them, leave a message, I get a message back from a lawyer that says, do not contact my client. So it looks like the elite doesn't want to talk to CM Punk to mend fences. And then he would go on to say, well, you know, I'm ready to mend fences. If they don't want to, that's fine. I don't care. Mm. That's not my business. You know, that's not none of my business. Who cares? What do you think about that? Knowing what we know now about the match and, and well, not even the match because that was even prior, but like I say, stuff had been building up for so long, it does make a little more sense. And, I, and as long as the deal is with him and Tony, because ultimately his actions at Brawl Out set the company into a different path than where they should have been going after this night. Mm-hmm. So if he made good with Tony about this, that's really all that matters. As far as him and the Bucks go, yeah, they're probably not going to speak again, and that's fine. And you know what? That is their business. And if he's saying he's reached out, I mean, that does put a lot of pressure on the Bucks to kind of say, like, well, on, on their end. But, they, but they're but they probably not going to speak about it, nor should they. Like, I don't feel they need to. But I think, like, if perception is reality, Punk is coming across a certain way here. I will put it this way, and it's going to be the first time you hear it, and it's, it, there's no mistake because I will go in it deeper after we put everything on the table. I think Punk's coming at this, you know, whether you like him or not, He's coming at this from a business standpoint. Mm -hmm. Did he let emotion get in the way? Absolutely. Absolutely. He admits that. That was one of the things that was odd for me. You don't hear CM Punk often 
state that he made a mistake. Mm-hmm. You know, even when he lost in the UFC, he made up excuses. Okay, like like it's true. I'm not bullshitting. You go right. back and look. As mm-hmm. he would say, "Tell me I'm lying." Yeah, I don't think I am there. So to 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 see the fact that he actually owned up and said, "Yeah, could I have handled that differently?" Absolutely. This is the reason I did it because I was frustrated. I was angry. I was beat up. I was tired. I was injured. You know, I knew I injured myself during that match. Mm-hmm. So here I am, injured, tired, beat up, and there's all this stuff going on. And I get in the room, and you know, it happens. I apologize to Tony because it was unprofessional. I'm willing to mend fences here. If the other guys don't want to do business and mend fences. That's fine. Just know that I've tried. Yeah. I think that's perfectly fine, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, he would go on to kind of say the one thing that I found interesting that nobody picked up on because everybody was more of the salacious stuff, which I don't think it was the salacious stuff was that salacious. He was just giving his side of the story right. as far as he could because obviously he's not going to talk about the fight. He's not going to talk about the stuff that's legal because we've gotten past all that. Mm-hmm. And obviously there was legalities to it. There was police involved. We do know that. Right. There was third-party investigators involved. We do know that. So – there's no reason to bring that up. Mm-hmm. That's been sorted out in the back. There's probably been NDAs signed in the whole nine. So there's no reason to go into that. And I, anybody who thought he was going to, you're a fool for thinking so. In exactly. My so the thing that I thought was more important here is we had heard Tony Khan recently say that there was no such thing as a brand split in AEW. Mm-hmm. But CM Punk said in this interview that, uh, yeah, the, you know, there's going to be some guys who only work collision. And there's going to be some guys who only work dynamite. So that's a brand split. Yeah. So I'm kind of confused about that, but we'll see how it plays out because I the only thing that I have a problem with there from a professional wrestling standpoint is where do we go if you want to make Punk champion? Where do we go if like uh, an Andrade, you want to make him champion? Now, my idea still stands, and I said it for Rampage, but I think it's better now with Collision. The TNT title should stay on Collision. The TNT title, because it's on TNT, should be defended if not weekly, at least bi-weekly on Collision. I would like it to see weekly, by the way. Mm -hmm. And then the TBS title, and yes, I know it's the women's division, but that doesn't matter. Let's build that up. Should be defended like it has been recently with Chris Statlander as your champion every week on Dynamite, which is on TBS. I think that that should be an edict. So I'm good with that because then you have a title for each show. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the international title can move freely. The world title has to move freely. The tag titles have to move freely. The women's World championship has to move freely. And I'm fine with all that. But then there's some hiccups in there. What if, do we know if FTR is on that don't go to Dynamite? We've seen him on Dynamite. But now that Punk's back, is there feelings from other people? Because it seems like a lot of these edicts are coming up from people's feelings and not doing business. And once again, I'm going to stress this because there's a big part coming to it when we talk about the beginning of Collision. What are your thoughts on this? Because I think that this is going to make it a rough patch. CM Punk is a major star. AEW didn't make him a star. He said that on the way to the back on Collision. Mm -hmm. You didn't make me a star. I am a star already. And I think that that was pointed directly at some of these naysayers out there, Tony Khan, and of course the elite. I think what a lot of people, in my opinion, need to remember, it's called the professional wrestling business. We're going to get into that once again, but I like you saying it. So... If you're willing to do business, egos need to get checked at the door for the sake of the business because your ego is not the one getting paid. It's what you do at your business is what's getting paid. Even better than that, we know there's guys in WWE that don't get along. Seth Rollins and Cody Rhodes mm-hmm. have made no gripe that they don't like each other right? personally. But they go in the ring, and they do business. As a matter of fact, Cody Rhodes was injured in a Hell in a Cell match. He was injured before going in, obviously, as we know, the pack. And if if you wanted to go into business for yourself, Seth Rollins could have made it a lot worse. Absolutely. But Seth Rollins took care of him during that match. He took care of his body during that match. He was careful with him to, to, to not make the injury worse than what it already was. Mm-hmm. And even though they didn't like each other, he went out of his way. That's what business is. You don't have to personally like anybody, but you have to be able to do business with that person exactly and i think that's where punk's coming from and you know as a guy who criticizes punk's attitude because i think that that's fair yes especially knowing extra things that i know Mm -hmm. through my time in the business and guys that i know who are top guys in 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 companies right and there's a reason why we've talked about it before why some of those guys don't like him and you know he's been known to be a prick Mm -hmm. we'll just call it what it is I think in this case, he came off on this interview and what we're about to talk about, because we have to tie it all together in his opening promo, I think he came off as a guy who's like, hey, I don't care if you like me or not. I'm here to do business. 
Yeah. Like personal feelings aside, we're trying to make a wrestling show that's the highest rated show that we want to, you know, you say you want to compete with WWE, even though we're not there yet. Hey, but you know what? We still need to do business if we want to move on. Let's talk about Collision because uh, I want to talk about our feelings about Collision as a whole. But let's, we have to talk about the opening promo, obviously. Mm-hmm. Opening promo, no surprise in Chicago at the United Center. Yeah. CM Punk. And his and he the first thing he said first of all the first thing he did which is very telling he took off the little uh, AEW skirting from the microphone and discarded it mm-hmm. he didn't want it out of the mic when he was talking I don't know if that's personal or I don't know if that's a business thing he's doing or if he's just kind of I think it's more probably business I think he's trying to feed into his unhappiness if you will well I think he wanted to say that this was coming from him personally like the way I took it is this has nothing to do with AEW or representing them this is. Pepsi Phil, as he referred. Yeah. Well, I, first of all, we'll get to that yeah. first because the first thing he does say and touches on, this is the professional wrestling business. Yep. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what it is. At the end of the day, this is a business, and that's where he goes in. You fans have been here for me. That's why I'm here. Mm-hmm. It's because you fans have been here for me, and I owe my entire career to all of you. So I see signs out there. That guy's got a sign that says Pepsi Phil. You want to call me Pepsi Phil? Go for it. I'm all behind it. This guy says CM Punk rules. That's right. I'm all behind that. This guy says CM Junk over here. Hey, if you want to boo me, that's cool too. I don't care if you guys cheer for me or boo me. As long as you are reacting, I'm doing my job because my job is to give you what you paid for. Mm -hmm. So if you want to call me Pepsi Phil, if you want to say that I rule or that I'm trash, that is absolutely fine. I thought that was perfect. Absolutely. He went right after the naysayers. I don't care if you boo me or not. The whole point is I'm here to try to do the best I can and give the money. So the people who want to see me and are my fans, this is for you. For the people who want to boo me, I'm still going to entertain you. Yeah. And I'm just like, I couldn't have. I'm like, man, that is a great promo. And he would then go on (laughs) to take some shots. Mm -hmm. He said, I got a lot of nicknames from people. David Zasloff calls me (laughs) one Bill Phil. And he goes, you know why? Because in a business, because uh, uh, I'm the real deal in a business full of counterfeit bucks. Boom. Of course, the Young Bucks did respond in their bio. Yeah. That if this was 2018, they would have put it on a t-shirt on PWT already. But I'm just like, guys, you're the guys not answering the phone, allegedly. Mm-hmm. You're the guys that are hiding behind lawyers and not you know, wanting to do business. Obviously, WB is behind CM Punk because that's why we have collision, allegedly. And I think there's some uh, there's some smoke to that fire. There looks to be some smoke. I so mean, you, as executive vice presidents, in name only, let's be honest mm-hmm. at this point, you guys should be very happy that you have another show. And that even though the ratings are good for TNT, let's be honest, you're not over a million. Right. And I'm not, once again, we're not the show that drags on the minutes. But once again, does that mean another two-hour show on Saturdays normally? No. The name CM Punk got you another two hours on Saturday. I'm sorry. Let's just call it like it is. No, that, that's am I a, wrong? No, you're not wrong. Sorry. In his words, tell me when I'm lying. No, because this is a business, and the egos are the one thing that, at least in my opinion, are holding this company back from going further. And I think this is case evident that Punk came off like the voice of reason because everything he said in this promo was about business. There was no real oh, person. Oh, he took his shots. Well, he took his shots. <laughs> like I'm saying, I'm not saying he was perfect about this, but the overall message that came across is we're doing business. If you're sitting there watching at home, if you're here at the arena, you can love me, you can hate me, I don't care. I'm here to do my job. And that is the big tell sign that came from this. And sure, he got some shots in there as well because he was going to throw something in there. Oh, of course he is. You give but, him a live microphone. We knew that. Exactly. But that's why I say when the minute he, talk, he took off the AEW logo from the microphone, that's how you knew it was coming from him. And that's the message he wanted to send out. Of course, he would go on to keep saying things, tell me when I'm lying. I did like that part of the promo, although I will say this, CM Punk. Uh, to be fair, you did not sell out Budokan mm-hmm. uh, because the, the show you were on in Budokan didn't – it wasn't a sellout by like this. It might've been a sellout for the tickets sold. I'm not sure. I don't know how many tickets WWE opened up for it, but according to how many people fit into Budokan, it wasn't a show. Once again, if they only made 5,000 tickets available, then technically it's a sellout. 
but sure. it wasn't a true sellout. I, I I will agree with him, which some people were picking on that he didn't sell out the United Center. I don't know. He sold out the United Center the first time. Mm-hmm. This time they only did a little over ten thousand tickets, which is still a lot of tickets. But the first time was over fifteen thousand, and for a wrestling show at the United Center, that's pretty big. Yeah, uh, I'm not gonna you know for a wrestling show anywhere, that's pretty big. So I'm not gonna shit on him there. There's a lot of things that he said, but uh, the Budokan thing, I'll give. I, I have to say, you know, technically it wasn't a sellout, but whatever, Phil. I'm all right with you, Pepsi Phil, because that's what I'm gonna call him from now on because I like it. And he told he said we can all call him Pepsi Phil. So this is true. Phil it is. Uh, so here's the thing. I do like how he came back at the end. And you notice when he came out, he had a red velvet bag in his hand, Mm -hmm. and he had a pair of wrestling shoes around his neck. And he said, "What's he ends the promo by saying, what's in this bag is the thing that nobody ever beat before. So the AEW championship was in that bag. Mm -hmm. His AEW championship, I should say, is in that bag. He said, this is the thing that nobody ever beat me for. And until somebody pins my shoulders to the mat or makes me submit, I'm going to hold on to this. And then he goes on to say, these boots... Yeah, there's some of you that would love me to leave these in the ring and walk away because you don't like me. Well, guess what? I'll tell you what. I'll leave these in the ring when there's somebody who comes in this company who can fill them. I just went, ooh, shots fired. Ch- yeah. But that's a but that's a good challenge. I'm gonna exactly. Say, listen, listen. If somebody can come in and become a star, like like CM Punk, like I said, walking up the ramp. I already mentioned it. Walking up the ramp, he looks in the camera and he says, "I, you didn't make me a star because I was already a star." He's not lying. Until somebody reaches the level, there is nobody in that company, including Chris Jericho. Yeah, I said it. Who has reached the stardom that CM Punk is? Chris Jericho, great wrestler. He's a wrestler's wrestler. He's a Hall of Famer. Don't get me wrong, but. Has has he did he held the WWE World Championship for a record amount of days at the time? No. Was he champion? Like I said, for a year and a half, a couple of WrestleManias. No. Is he a guy who, until this point, and still has a he used to have arenas full, but now at least half of an arena full of people chanting CM Punk? Mm-hmm. Were people chanting Jericho when he's not on the show? No, they weren't. But think about it, WWE shows, he was gone for seven years. And uh, and when the show was bad, especially, you start to hear those CM Punk chants. Right. Even when he was gone right now from AEW, CM Punk chants. We've said it before, (laughs) ECW and CM Punk seem to be the two things chanted in more arenas than anywhere else Mm -hmm. in wrestling. And that was over those seven years. Now that he's returned, they still do it. Now that there's a certain amount of the all elite wrestling fans who do not like him, it's less, it's not the full building. Right. But it is wrestling. We got to do talk about the one vicious thing he said. He said that uh, I believe people think that I owe some people an apology. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you this. For those people who think that I owe an apology, I apologize that you're softer than the wrestlers that you cheer for. (sighs) I just went, oh, shit. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> CM Punk dropping pipe bombs. What did you expect giving him a live mic? And once again, this could have all been easily. No, it could be a work, but I don't think it's a work. I don't think it is. And and we've said this before, and there's a lot of people who have that same belief because if it was a work, you would have ended this night with the elite running mm-hmm. because you want to take advantage of that money right away. Trust yeah. me. This is not a thing you sit on the shelf. Yeah. The, the thing is, is that Punk's right. They're not mending fences. So that's why we, if you can't get along, we're going to separate you. That's fine. Whatever. It's a good business decision at the end of the day to make more money for AEW. I'll give them credit there. Mm -hmm. However, this is a money-making opportunity. Even Punk talks about that in ESPN that we didn't mention. He said it's bad that this isn't something that we can mend because we can make, as a wrestler, you always think about how we can make money. We can make a ton of money off of this. Oh, absolutely. But instead, people don't want to answer phone calls and want to go through lawyers. Okay. I get it. Whatever. But I'm going to do business. I loved it. He's not wrong. I'm sorry. Until proven otherwise, he's not wrong. I don't know why people won't come to the table and just go, hey, we don't have to like each other. As a matter of fact, we don't like each other. But that won't stop us from making money. It's the aura that he came with that during this whole mystery of what happened, what really happened with Brawl Out, which, like I say, we have just got more rumors than anything. We only know certain facts. The mystique around Punk returning to AEW has been just looming overhead for months now. So fans are going to have a polarizing reaction no matter what. They're either going to be really happy to see him back or they're going to be really mad because they're team Young Bucks, team Elite, whatever you want to define it as. But I thought with this promo, he aired a lot and he came from that business perspective. And to even harken back to something in comparison to John Cena and Roman Reigns. 
Remember when Roman was supposed to be the next guy and, and John said, I have to come back because you're not ready to take my crown. Absolutely. That's almost in this kind of parallel what Punk was saying here. Like, you want me gone? Find somebody to fill my shoes. And that was real? Yeah. When Cena did it to Reigns? Absolutely. It's real now? So it's real. When, you, when you teeter on that line and, and say what you will about Punk, his mic skills are second to none. He knows how to teeter that line between reality and, and working. And he borrowed here and there that this is why this promo stood out. This is why it generated that much buzz. The shots he took definitely were were impactful. And this is now where he's going to be going moving forward, and especially to see what he does with his own show, which we'll get into our first opinions of this. But if this is any indication, there is promise that the business side of things might be on the upside. Let's talk about Collision. Uh, I love the set. I thought the set looked clean. Yep. Like it's super clean. Yeah. Like I like I heard some people comparing it to like WWE sets. That's fine. But that look that looks cleaner than Dynamite set. I like it. I personally do. Uh, I like the setup. I like I like the ringside. I I actually don't mind the commentary uh, spot at ringside because it does set it apart. I like it because like uh, I I equate it to like remember when Raw had the the by the by the ramp mm-hmm. one and then SmackDown had ringside. I like that they're trying to separate the shows. Yeah, the barricades looked a little different. I like that. Um, I did not like the commentating. I'm a Kevin Kelly fan in Japan. I was me and me and our good friend Walt were talking about this. I think in Japan, where wrestling is still treated like a real sport, if you will, his straight laced, you know, kind of, I don't want to say monotone because he does come out of the monotonous sometimes, mm-hmm. but that is like more fit to be the straight guy on the mic in Japan. Yeah. It doesn't work in the States, especially when you have Nigel McGuinness who tried to be witty, but he just fell short. I think what they should do is they, I, I think they should swap Taz and Nigel. Mm-hmm. If you're going to keep Kevin Kelly on on collision, put Nigel in in, in the heel rooting for a role on uh, on Dynamite because then you have Tony Schiavone and Excalibur's personalities to cover up his lack of one yeah. for loss of better term, mm-hmm. and then on the uh, put Taz on collision with Kevin Kelly because where Kevin Kelly's the you know very like down the line the the straight guy you can have the color commentator be Taz and Taz is amazing at it. You know, think about him and Michael Cole for a long time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I think that you could make that. And, of course, I think we. I don't think we're going to have a three. I think only the main events are going to have the three-man. But this week, you can't blame it on JR. Unfortunately, JR had a bad fall. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he was there is speaking a testament to who JR is. Yeah. So, you know, or, you know, our thoughts and, you know, you know, T's and P's, if you will, right. are with Jim Ross and absolutely. getting better. Uh, so I do not blame how he sounded. I know some people took shots at that, which is disturbing and disgusting, but we all know how the internet is. Mm-hmm. That is not his fault. He did right. take a fall. I do I do like how they tried to cover it up because I think uh, Nigel was the one that was like, oh, you know, I, I hate to see the other guy. Yeah. Like, like, you know, but JR was very upfront, like, no, that's what happens when you get older. You know, sometimes you just lose your balance. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, I felt bad, but dude, that is old school as it gets. He still made the talent. Absolutely. And his, he, his eye looked like crap. So hopefully he gets better. Maybe should take a week or two off to heal up. And and I'll be happy just to see him, hopefully just in the main events. Yeah. But, I mean, on that show, he could definitely add more than he did to Dynamite because, like I said, I just wasn't feeling the commentators. I don't know. Were you? No, that that's one thing. I, I understand it's first-time shows, but, yeah, there was something that was that was lacking there for being that big debut, especially to have that high energy. And it's nothing against Kevin Kelly. I like him in New Japan. Mm-hmm. But I think for this one, they needed somebody there to really – I'm not saying be over the top animated, but they needed something to really kind of sell how big this event was. And I just think that his style is not that. It's it's like you touched upon. It's more traditional sports and just very monotone, very level. It doesn't really like get super amped up and have to go, you know, like, whoa, you know, like in, in the comparison, like uh, Morrow. Yes. Like I think like if Morrow was there, I think that would have gone over a little more. But I do agree. I think if you switch it up and brought Taz over there, I think that would help a, a lot more. Nigel, I, I thought was good, but I thought he was trying too hard, and you yeah. could see him pressing. Yeah, and also he's not he's not known to be loud and boisterous. Right. When you get a Taz in there, Taz is, is known to do that, so that works out better. Uh, I will also say, Kevin Kelly, as much as I love him, he could not say Andrade El Idolo to save his life. Yeah. He messed up the Idolo part a ton of times, and he even called him Andre a couple times. And I was like, hey. And I get it, you know, first time, maybe some jitters, whatever. But then when he messed up Kazuchika Okada's name, I'm like, you call 
his yeah. matches on a regular basis. And I can't even say how he said Kazuchka. He said it really weird. And I'm like, that's not how you present, you know, I've heard you say his name right a million times. You've called a ton of his stuff. So the fact that you said his name wrong was kind of weird. And once again, not going to pick on the guy. It's just like, I'm not going to pick on the ring announcer for saying Buddy Matthews. Yeah, or Buddy Murphy. Or, I thought she said Buddy Matthews. Or maybe it was or Buddy. No, it's Buddy Murphy. Yeah, it was she said Buddy, Buddy Murphy. Murphy instead of Buddy Matthews. Yeah. That's what it was. Why I, I got it backwards. But yeah, she called him by his WWE name. And I'm like, did she work for WWE? Because if she did, that yeah. makes a little more sense. But uh, that was a rough one. But I, once again, I'm not going to crucify her like the internet. Sure. Did. I mean, the whole thing is, Everybody was really excited, and I think they were really pressing too much, like top to bottom on the production side, which that'll get better as the weeks go on because there's a new team thrown together, and they just mm. got to get their footings. Yeah, I'm not going to judge them for that. I think, that. I think they did pretty good for overall on that side. Sure, yeah. Just commentating was like a little bit. Once again, maybe next week, Kevin Kelly's it was jitters, and next week he comes out and kills it. Mm. Uh, so let's go to t- talk about the, the actual event and matches. I, I dug the uh, TNT title match, except yeah. for the finish was eh. Yeah. You know, but and on top of that, hot potato in the belt again, new champion Luchasaurus. Although it's kind of weird because, uh, you know, the pillar, Jack Perry, never champion Luchasaurus beat him there. Uh, I don't know if I like that long term storytelling personally, but once again, I thought the match was fine. Uh, I loved uh, I loved the the Buddy Matthews Andrade match. That was very, and those very good. guys, by the way, I know some people were like judging certain things in that match. You don't get that that shit was done on purpose. Yeah. Buddy Matthews at one point in juncture does slip on the rope, but he then turns it into selling the knee, which, of course, was being worked on by Andrade. I thought it was a, like, who thinks about, oh, shit, I slipped. Oh, let's just sell the knee. Yeah. Oh, my God. Like, it was like, and, and Andrade did the same with the shoulder. You know, Andrade looked good coming back. Mm-hmm. I thought he looked like a million bucks. He looks like a guy that should be a world champion. Let's be honest. Yeah, oh, yeah. And uh, I, I did love the fact that both of them used their ladies, uh, so, you know, uh, submission, fin- moves. submission finishers, if yep. you will, including Andrade using it to win. I know uh, Fuego Del Sol took a shot at it, but come on, calm yourself down, kid. Yeah. What have you been doing lately? Um, you just want to be Andrade, I guess. Who knows? I, I this is what I this is the Civil War at AEW is weird to me. Well, that's all like because wrestlers you should be cheering for the three letters if you work for that promotion. If you don't like Andrade, if you don't like you know Punk, if you don't like you, but you still need to cheer for the win, and that's what Punk even mentioned. Yeah, like, you don't have to cheer for me, but let's cheer for the win. Well, that's the whole thing. You're cheering for the business because if the business does well, you do well. Like, why would you sit there and take shots like that? This is a big night for your company. This should be a highlight in AEW's history, and yet there's shots like that getting done, and there's no purpose. Like, it's just too many emotions run through. Like, this is high school when you guys should be in graduate school. My biggest uh, thing that I want to give credit full to for Collision felt different from Dynamite. There's some people who didn't think so. I did. And the reason why, we didn't have as many useless promos. Mm -hmm. Technically, we only had one with the acclaimed. Yeah. And outside of that, we didn't have a lot of... Dynamite has a ton of useless promos. Mm -hmm. So I I enjoyed that. There was a couple promos that were done because of guys coming back. Scorpio Sky being one of them. I was excited for that. Very excited. So so I like like the fact that they put those vignettes and those spots in to remind us that there's guys that we haven't seen in a while that are now going to be on collision. I'm dealing with... I love it. Miro coming back. My only gripe, Miro looked amazing. My only gripe is that match should have been three minutes long. Yeah. You know, that should have been a straight squash. I mean, it technically was still. There was some offense by Nice, but there needed to be no offense. Let Miro look like the monster that he is. I thought he looked like a million bucks coming back. Can't wait to see more from Miro. Um, My only rough match of the night was the women's tag match. Once again, listen, this is where you can use the word buried. The outcasts are a buried team. Mm -hmm. They are the women's equivalent of the Dark Order. Let's be honest. Yeah. And you're in the and the AEW Women's World Champion is in the group. Yeah. And once again, I I, I know I'm going to credit Walt with this, and I agree with it. Once again, second champion in a row where that champion feels like a lackey to somebody else. Not Jamie wrong. Hader was the lackey to Britt Baker. Mm-hmm. That's how they portrayed her, and now they portray Tony Storm as the lackey of Soraya. Yeah. So like, it's weird, man. And once again, I get given the win to the hometown girl, but really, and I know like Willow is you know the NJPW strong champion, but your women's world champion is in this match. Yeah. It's... And like when you, you know how good the match is when everybody's only talking about the pictures of Sky Blue's backside. Yeah. That's how you know the match wasn't good. I'm sorry. No, I agree with you. I mean. It... How they're booking the outcasts, it's it's puzzling. Like, I just, I don't get it because I take a look at the competition. And you even, like, when you look at Impact and how they book their world champion. And then, obviously, WWE, 
it's like, what are we doing wrong here? Because like that's the kind of vibe. Because I agree with you. It feels like the champion is the second fiddle to somebody else in the faction. Mm-hmm. And it shouldn't be like that. It should always be whoever the head person of said faction is, is the world champion. And then you kind of build up you know, somebody else to take the crown from them eventually. Absolutely. Main event, what can I say? They gave it all the time in the world. Loved Absolutely. It. That match was amazing. That, that, that could have been a pay. That's a, listen, listen, remember when we were critical of Double or Nothing? That's a pay-per-view quality match, Tony Khan. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God, FTR. Does anybody sell better than the FTR? <sighs> Punk had a little bit Hardly, of ring rust, yeah. but nothing to really notice. But you could tell he had a little bit. I'm, I'm sure he would admit that. But it's not like it distracted the match. I think doing a six-man tag with him was perfect because when he kind of like looked like he was a little off, he got out of the ring. Yeah. And I thought it was perfect. How big was the crowd for Joe and oh, Punk my God. meeting in the middle of that ring? Jay White and Juice Robinson did a great job. We all knew Juice would eat the pin. I'm all right with that. I don't care. I thought it was a really, really good main event, and that's how you end a fucking show. Love the main event, yeah. There's my F-bomb. That's how you end a fucking show. Well, they did because, you know, it wasn't any run-ins, wasn't any nonsense. It was wrestling, and that's what we got. Oh, absolutely. Like I said, most of the matches, I don't even think, was there a match that ended with a run-in? I don't think any of them did. No, I don't think any did. So I separated a lot from Dynamite. I really was impressed with the show overall. I thought, like I said, there was only one bad match, Mm -hmm. in my opinion. Nothing against any of those ladies. I'm a big Willow Nightingale fan. Yeah. Sky same. Blue is 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 an up and comer, but I just don't think she's there yet. They're pushing her a little too soon, too quickly. Yeah. And Tony Storm and Ruby Soho deserve better. Bottom line. And I think that this is that's the problem that they've had mm-hmm. with this particular storyline. So, but overall, Collision was good. Collision was good. I'm not saying that I would choose Collision over a GCW card. Right. Or a Pro Wrestling Revolver card like I I did this weekend. Mm-hmm. I, not GCW, but Pro Wrestling Revolver. GCW came on after, but Pro Wrestling Revolver. When I went back and rewatched, it was a better show. But once again, it's an indie show that happens once a once a month, and Pro Wrestling Revolver puts on all the time. By the way, John Moxley on that show. <laughs> you know what I mean? Takeshita yeah. was supposed to be on the show, but for whatever travel reasons, as you notice, he wasn't. He ended up not being on the show. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I once again, I think Pro. You know, I wouldn't choose it over a stack card like that. But if I'm home and there's not a stat card on a Saturday, I'd watch a collision. Or if they have something big. Anytime you have a, a main event, the quality that they had and announced, I'll tune in. Whoever was responsible for you know booking all those matches and, and putting that show together really deserves some praise because this was the best AEW program of the week, hands down. And I think that they there is a lot of room to grow on this show. But you see how it opened up. And I understand CM Punk was back in Chicago. But still, if you're going to do a promo like that, do something to really excite the crowd off the bell. And like I always say, if you have Orange Cassidy come out and defend the international title off the bell, that's great. But then have something strong to follow up. I thought the in-ring stuff was great because we didn't have that many promos. I think we had like one from, what, the Hardys and... There was a there was one from the Hardys. We did have the stoppage to do the, like what's coming up on Dynamite stuff, which I'm okay with. I get plug in your other yeah, shows. I'm not a fan of how they do it. You could do it a little differently. You could do it throughout the night in little promos instead of just doing it all together like they try to do. Uh, so I mean, there's certain things that I would change, but that's just things I would change. I don't think it hurt the show a ton. No, it didn't hurt at all. I like mean, I said, the only throwaway promo to me was the acclaimed. I get it. It got the crowd in Chicago to pop, but for us at home, it's like. Uh, Do I really care? No, I mean... Like you could have done that during the commercial break for the live crowd and came back with a match and used that TV time better. Just my just my opinion. No, I agree with it. I mean, I think, heck, even during the picture-in-picture, picture, like, that'd be a time to release it on social media, like, post where you're We've doing shows about and then come back. Yeah. yeah, I mean... Like, do it on YouTube or on Twitter or wherever. Just do something exclusive. Do it on AEW.com, whatever. Yeah, do something to get make that more focused because if you think fans are tuning into the show to see what's coming on next week... Like for seeing promo cards, like it's not happening. I'm sorry. People tune in to see wrestling, and that's why this show worked. We saw wrestling. We need to see more wrestling with storylines to have us hooked. And I get that Tony Khan is booking all of this, but you know what? You're going to have to book harder on Dynamite. Yeah. Because I think that the line was drawn in the sand, and this is real life. I think what Punk said was a rally cry, not just to him, but to the people who are just on collision, Yeah. which includes Miro and Andrade. Yeah, I think that the line in the sand has been drawn. And they're going to come out there and they're going to bust their ass. Like I said, Andrade, Buddy Matthews, that's a great match. It would have been match of the night any other night, any other program, if it wasn't for the main event. Mm-hmm. Agreed. But it still would have been match of the night. I, I mean, you could have put that on Raw and it would have been match of the night. Mm-hmm. You could have put it on SmackDown it would have been match of the night. That was just a great match. But the main event delivered like it should. Yeah. 
And I love the fact that they didn't throw the main event away as the opening. Yeah. Book ended it with Punk, which was perfect. We got the promo of him coming back. And then we got him in the main event. Perfect. And that was, that's been a, my criticism for a long time. So maybe they're, I've heard that Dax Harwood is having something to do with creative these days, yeah. allegedly. If this is his inputs, then he did a good job. But I mean, at the end of the day, we'll give Tony Khan credit because he's the booker. I don't say that often, but it was a good show. Mm-hmm. With that, let's uh, switch gears because uh, Collision was good. But the one criticism that I can make is that we got no new news about Forbidden Door. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's, it's it's puzzling to me that we are literally, as we record this, we're recording this at Sunday on Sunday night at 8.07 p.m. So mm. we're literally a week away. Yep. Because the show starts at 7.30. Uh, the main show starts at 8. So literally, we're a week away from Forbidden Door, and we got five matches. I'm sure they'll shore it up. I know it's a New Japan joint show, but we should there should be a little more. I understand that they've given us some filet mignon, too. Don't get me wrong. We got some great matches announced. Mm-hmm. However, I think you should give us a little more coming a week out. So let's preview what we have to close out the show, shall we, Ken? Let's do it. So, of course, All Elite Wrestling and New Japan Pro Wrestling present Forbidden Door 2023 uh, on Sunday, 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 June 25th, 2023, starting at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Main show starts at 8. We just mentioned that. From the Scotiabank Arena in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. We're going international, folks. Uh, so let's talk about the five matches that we got. So. First match we'll talk about, uh, because it's a match that we've championed for a long time, and it is a match that was asked for at New York Comic Con in 2021. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, we're finally going to get it. The AEW International Champion will be putting his title on the line, going, uh, uh, that'd be Orange Cassidy. Yep. And he'll be taking on the New Japan Wrestling World Television Champion, Zack Sabre Jr. I can't wait for this. Ever since Cassidy broke character... And if you were at the panel in New York Comic Con, you knew this too. He is excited to put this to have this match finally. The energy he came with this and like immediately cut that question off to like really scream out he wanted to wrestle Zack Saber Jr. That goes to show about one how much he respects Zack Saber Jr. and two how much he's going to put into this match. This could be match of the night. Are you going to put it out there? I agree. Next up, we'll talk about the match that should not happen. And by that, I mean the AEW World Championship will be on the line. Your champion, MJF, taking on the ace, Hiroshi Tanahashi. And I'm going to tell you why it should have not happened. Not because I don't think it would be a good match. Mm -hmm. I think it would. But let's be honest. MJF has said for a long time he thinks New Japan is, is hack. Yeah. Why have him on this show? If they're smart, this match never happens. If they're smart, he no shows the show. You build it up that he no showed. And then you put Tanahashi in there against somebody else. Or you know what I mean? You pick pick a oh, guy, right. open challenge. No, I this is what's gonna happen. He's gonna cut a promo and he's gonna say, I'm not coming down there to wrestle you. I'm the AEW champion. I, I don't wrestle indies. Like he'll do something like that. And then he'll he'll have somebody else come out to face him. Like he'll say, like, I, I, I paid somebody to come and take care of you for tonight. That that would be the smart way. I fear that they're going to do on dy- uh, Dynamite MJF saying he's not going to do it again, and Tony Khan threatening to strip the title off him or something. Yeah. And then we get the match. Listen, I, I like the line that MJF walks about being an asshole. Mm-hmm. And I think that that would be better storytelling. Remember, he wasn't on last year's Forbidden Door. Right. And he shouldn't be on this year's because it makes the allure there. But make it look like he's no-showing. And I like what you said. I'll have pick a, cha- a person to challenge you. No title on the line, though. No dice guy. Mm-hmm. Just like he did on Dynamite. It was perfect. Next up, another match that I'm not pumped about. Probably the only one out of these that I'm not pumped about. For the IWGP World Championship, your champion Sonata going one-on-one with Jungle Boy Jack Perry with Hook in his corner. And why? Why? Of all the choices we could make to take on Sonata. I get it. Some people on the internet have already been like, well, they need somebody to eat a pin because obviously he's not got a shot in hell of winning. But why couldn't we pick somebody different? Hangman Page comes to mind. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a big star. Yeah, last year he got the title shot in the four-way, but one-on-one title shot's fine. And it would be a good match. He still can eat the pin. There's a million people. Ricky Starks could have filled in here because he's more entertaining than Jack Perry. I don't. I know there's Jack Perry fans, and I'm going to get shit from the diehard Ollie fans that think that he's great. But let's be honest, he's not. Out of the quote-unquote pillars, he is the lesser than of them. He's the lesser Sammy one. Sammy Guevara, for Christ's sake. Yeah. I mean, it's the one thing about booking this match. Like, this one is not exciting anybody. I'm sorry. And if the whole reason to do this is to finally turn Jack Perry heel, I think this is a waste of a primetime moment, to be honest with you, because Sonata is not losing this. I understand that there's a lot of talk about 
something magical can happen coming out of the show to paraphrase. Like there's something that, you know, the Jack Perry heel turn. Let's yeah. Just call it what it is. Right. But I'm saying like, if he wins the, he's the not title, winning the which, title. which I say, he's not going to, but if the whole, if the sole purpose is for him to turn heel and go back to Chris, uh, Christian cage, which I think is fully going to happen here. It's, it's a waste of a moment. And I'm sorry for a show that is supposed to have every match with a, with a special feel to it. Like I say, this does not have that. This is lackluster, in my opinion. I got a great idea. Why couldn't Sonata take on Adam Cole? Baby. You know, why not? Better match. Oh, absolutely. Better match. Better match. Like, I, like I say, like you're, <laughs> there's a million different reasons you can go with this. By the way, that would be one. Remember, we have some unfinished business because of Dynamite because Adam Cole didn't beat the time clock, so he didn't win the match, so he didn't win the Eliminator. What if MJF is like, oh, well, uh, Adam Cole has to face Tanahashi. If you can beat Tanahashi, eh. I'll think about giving you a shot. There you go. I mean, that writes itself. That's yeah. just personally. Uh, let's talk about the two matches, though, that are left, and then speculate on some things real quick before we uh, get out of here. Of course, these are the two matches that are worth the entirety of the $50. Oh, my God, yeah. In that first one, in a dream match, and it is a dream, the American Dragon, Brian Danielson, goes one-on-one with the Rainmaker, Kazuchika Okada. Oh, oh my God. Take my money. Yeah. Take my money. Listen. If you told me that I'm getting Okada versus Danielson, I don't care. Let's go. This is gonna Let's be go. This is gonna be incredible. And this is why a match like and honestly, sorry, it make you sound like it. This is why a match like Jay, uh, you know, Jack Perry versus uh, Sonata bothers me so much. You're on the same card as Okada Danielson. Yeah, you got to step up your A game. And that's not even that's not even it. That's not even the the, the end all be all. Mm-hmm. That's just one A and one B because the other one. For the IWGB United States Championship, your champion, the cleaner, Kenny Omega, go, the best bout machine, <sighs> goes match. one-on-one with the Billy Goat, Will Osprey, in their second match. Remember, they tied it up at Wrestle Kingdom. Osprey came up short. Osprey says he's coming into Canada and taking off. At the end of Dynamite, it was Osprey with that hook kick mm-hmm. that took out Omega. Come on, baby. Here we go. You got Omega versus Osprey 2 and Okada versus Danielson. And you're going to give me, you know, that's full aim and yawn, maybe. Yeah. And you're going to give me some chuck roast with uh, Jack Perry against Sonata. Yeah. Sonata deserves better than that. New Japan deserves better than that. And us fans deserve. Now, mind you, it's not wavering me from buying this pay-per-view because my $50, $25 of it can go to Okada Danielson, $25 of it can go to Osprey and Omega, and I've paid for my event, and I have zero. You'll never hear us complain about those matches. I promise nope. you. Unless some fluke, freak accident of God happens, mm-hmm. those two matches will be two of the best matches you see all year. Those are matches of the year candidates before they even happen. Oh, agreed. Am I wrong? No, th- this is the whole reason. You sold us on two matches. So you, normally I'd be a little more critical about the lackluster of uh, buildup for the show, but like, honest to God, you can't go wrong with those two. And the fact that we're going to get Orange Cassidy and Zack Sabre Jr., but that's me personally because I was in the room when the idea was thrown out there and we've been championing it every or every day since on social media. Like, you can go back through both 3FN Podcasts and ODPH Podcasts on Twitter. Like, we've been talking about we want to see this match. So, like, my money is already sold there. And like I say, the only match that I'm just like, what is the Sonata one? Yeah, and those are the ones announced. I mean, I'm sure there's some other things. I'm wondering what if we're going to do anything with the Bullet Club and Bullet Club Gold. Once again, we should have probably been building that a little better. Uh, I'm wondering if we're going to get any other title defenses. I mean, then, you know... If you don't do anything with Bullet Club and Bullet Club Gold, you know, are you going to put the uh, Never Open Weight Champion David Finley in a match? Mm. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions that we could be answering here that I wish we had the answers to, but we don't until the, the show. It would be nice to see Ricky Starks versus David Finley. Like he could that say, would be nice. he's like, oh, you have a problem with Bullet Club? Well, why don't you deal with the real Bullet Club? And there you go. And then you have something built in. Right. I like it. That, that puts that over a little bit more. Uh, as far as I know, Mercedes Monet is still out, right? Yes, as far as we know. Okay, so like I say, unless something crazy happened there where she comes in as like a surprise opponent like Tony Storm or somebody was just saying open challenge and now it comes Mercedes. Well, I knew they were trying to work something out with Stardom because that is the uh, partner, sister promotion, if you will, of uh, New Japan. Right. And unfortunately, Stardom has a big event that same weekend in Japan. Right. So it was going to be a little rougher, but I don't know if we might see maybe they could make a deal. Maybe they'll, you know, send a talent over there and send them them send a talent so that way it's equal equal. I don't mm. know. But as of right now, we don't know. 
Um, I'm I'm curious why the tag titles aren't going to be in uh, showcased. And I'm not talking about even on the line. Why don't we just put FTR, your AEW World Tag Team Champions, mm-hmm. against the IWGP World Tag Team Champions in uh, Goto and uh, Yoshihashi? And mind you, that team is the team that took the belts off of FTR. Yeah. So would... there's a built in there. You don't even have to put the belts on it. Just champions versus champions. Hell, if you wanted to make it a six man and add CM Punk and a partner to be named. Well, yeah, because I mean, Goto and Hashi are part of Chaos. So just another member of Chaos. Yeah. You had CM Punk and then we get uh, CMFTR versus. But then again, can can that happen because of who's in the back? See, this is where this is uh, this childish shit gets out of control because can we even have CM Punk on Forbidden Door? Because we already know that at least Kenny Omega is going to be there. Right. I don't know about the Young Bucks. I would assume so. You would assume that the Young Bucks, who were a huge tag team in Japan, Mm -hmm. would be on Forbidden Door, but they're not announced as of yet. Right. I mean, this is something that Tony and the powers that be at AEW are really going to have to sit there and think about after this card is done. Because if you keep off CM Punk and company because of that reason, in my opinion, you're throwing money out the window. And I'm sorry. like This should be a showcase of the best talent in AEW. Not the the best talent you can showcase on Saturday night or Wednesday night. And here's the other thing. No Moxley I mentioned yet. Right. Moxley's huge in Japan. He works for New Japan. Yeah. So why is you know, why is the Death Rider not on the card? You know, you could even tag him with Shota. Mm-hmm. Shota, if you will. Uh, you know, and, and you can have somebody else, you know. Maybe that's where you put I don't know. We have this weird Jericho Sammy Guevara storyline. On Dynamite, we got, you know, the two of them tagging with murder grandpa himself. Yeah. You know, Minoru uh, Suzuki to take on uh, the ragtag group of, you know, Darius, AR Fox, and uh, Action Andretti. Yeah. Which is an interesting put together team. So, I mean, other than storyline purposes of like a little dysfunction between Jericho and Guevara, there's no purpose to that, but that's not affecting, if you will. Is Suzuki going to be on the card? Maybe Suzuki versus Mox. But if that's things that are going to be worked on and that have happened. Why aren't we setting them up already? I'm just, I'm just throwing this out. Suzuki, Eddie Kingston. I'm just I'm throwing this out. I would to the love world. it because Eddie Kingston's going to be in the uh, G1 in July. Yeah. So this is a perfect way to put him on there, showcase him against Suzuki. Exactly. Great match, two strong style guys. You know, that's only like a six, seven minute match. That's perfect. Mm-hmm. They're going to go out there, beat the shit out of each other for sub 10 minutes and move on. Yeah. Perfect. I like that match. And once again, it makes sense because G1's coming up. I just think that we're not getting enough. And it's just like double or nothing all over again where we're waiting to the last week to book matches, and then they're going to wonder why. Now, mind you, the, the the one thing that this pay-per-view has going for it is those two matches we talked about. Okada Danielson, Osprey Omega is worth the price of admission. So for the fans that are going, we're already going to probably buy it, mm-hmm. or we're on the fence that we're leaning towards buying it, that's going to sell the pay-per-view. But what about the fans that don't know about this shit? What about the fans? And I know somebody's going to be like, oh, you're going to say casual fans. But you need some casuals in there. And, and not even casual fans of wrestling. What about the casual AEW fan? The fan that only watches All Elite Wrestling, but isn't in the Die Hard tribe. Because remember, some of the Die Hard tribe of AEW doesn't watch New Japan. That's why Forbidden Door, or that's what we were told last year, why Forbidden Door didn't do as high of a buy rate. Mm-hmm. Is because the hardcore AEW fans didn't necessarily tune in for it. Right. Whenever you're booking a show like this, you want to get as many eyes on the prize. And if they can't see the show then you failed. And that's the problem. You need to entice every single fan and give them something. You have two main event marquee matches here that should be enough to sell the show to casual fans, but have we hyped them up enough? And I'm sorry, a run-in at the end of Dynamite is not enough. You need to do some build-ups. We need to do some vignettes. You have a week to cut some promos, put them on YouTube, Put them on social media. Really build it up. Splice a video together. It can be 30 seconds. It can be two minutes, whatever the case is. You need to really start pushing it to get those late-minute buys because I'm sorry, as it stands right now, you're going to get the same numbers you have because those are the fans that are invested in your product, win, lose, or draw, and that's awesome. But if you want to continue to grow the business, you need to grow your reach. And you need to reach out to the people that have become disenfranchised with your product to really sell them on. You have a great card from what we know thus far. Why not double in and really push it this week and make something happen with it? 
go to a different route on social media? Are you doing a lot on TikTok? Are you doing a lot on YouTube? Are you really pushing that during your programming? Are you doing any cross promotions? Like, I mean, seriously, this is something you really want to highlight as a special event because it is. You have two of the biggest wrestling promotions on the planet coming together for one night. Push it like that. Yeah, they did a full court press with a collision. Yeah. I saw their ads all over social media. God, yeah. So they did a full court press. We should be doing that with Forbidden Door. Uh, in closing for this, I'm going to say this. I, and I want to make this clear, I hope the next week, because we'll be recording on a Monday. Mm-hmm. So the Monday after this goes down, I hope that we get together and go, man, that was one of the best pay-per-views I watched. I mean, there's two matches on there that are already giving you a head start. Yep. But it's going to be what's on the undercard that, you know, makes this pay-per-view, whether it's great or not. Okay. And I hope we get to come in here and say that. And I think we will, because let's be honest, those two matches are giving it a gigantic head start. Mm hmm. But that doesn't mean we get to rest off your morals. Like, like guys, get on there. Because then after this, we have to start building for All In in Wembley Stadium in London, England. Yeah. That is, you know, right around 70,000 tickets, depending upon who you talk to right now. But it can hold over 90,000. So there's still tickets that could be sold. Mm-hmm. So let's start pushing towards that. Let's start building towards that. Let's start getting the, the things together. Can CM Punk be on that show? Once mm-hmm. again, that's a weird take here. I don't know. We'll obviously be keeping our eyes on that in the coming months, but we need to, I say we like we work for AEW, but AEW needs to start building shows. AEW needs to start building interest in shows and not waiting until the absolute last minute like they have been. I think that's their biggest mistake. The reason people are tuning in to WWE and going to WWE house shows is because of the work that they are doing. And how do you get rewarded there? Roman Reigns defended a title and the Usos did a run in to continue a storyline on a house show. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a reward for house show business. Absolutely. I know AEW is not doing house shows anymore pretty much because of you know taping on Saturdays for Collision. But here's the thing. Ticket sales are down, guys. And I don't like to rag on it, but ticket sales are down. We need to get people in the door. Let's start building. Mm-hmm. Let's start building stuff. If you build it, they will come. Yeah. Famous movie quote. And in this case, just like WWE, listen, they're selling out house shows. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. When you guys are having problems selling dynamite and collision tapings, that doesn't mean the wrestling business is down. That means there's a disconnect. And that disconnect can be fixed easily. Mm-hmm. It really can. But that means start building things early. Let's not wait until the month before the pay-per-view or weeks before the pay-per-view. Let's not have just two matches, you know, announced uh, a month or two in advance and have those two stories. And you think those two stories are going to carry you through to the pay-per-view and then announce the rest of the card in the last two weeks. That's not going to work anymore. Let's build to where we need to be. Mm -hmm. I should be here right now being able to tell you more than five matches on Forbidden Door. Or even if I can't tell you more than five, I should know the direction that they are taking. I should be like, oh, they've already built this up, so I'm anticipating seeing this match. And they're building this up, so even though I haven't announced it, we're anticipating this match. Right. We can't do that. That is one of the flaws that AEW needs to fix completely. I And I mean that as constructive criticism only. Because I'm excited for Forbidden Door for two matches. But make me excited for Forbidden Door for the entire card. Mm-hmm. And I'm in New Japan, Mark, so you're winning me early. I know. You're winning, you're winning early on that note. I mean, me, I'm sold on three matches. Because like I said, I've been excited. Oh, yeah, I want to see Orange and, yeah, and, and Zach, but, too. But, but I'm just saying, those two matches are the reason why most people will buy this paper. Oh, exactly. But give them something that if they're a casual fan tuning in, they're going to be wa- wanting to tune into Wednesday to see. Because obviously we know after Wednesday things get reset. But impress the casual fan enough that they're going to want to tune in and say, man, I can't miss Wednesday because I was the action on here blew me away. I really want to see where we're going after this. Give us something like that. Like, seriously, you should be going so hard this week to push this pay-per-view. Three shows left. Yeah. Dynamite, Rampage, and then Collision. Mm-hmm. Let's sell it. Let's see it. But once again, my, my challenge, Tony Khan. Challenge of Tony Khan mm-hmm. is this. I have another challenge that we'll update in a second before we say goodbye. But my challenge of Tony Khan is, hey, let's build all in starting right after Let's get at least a couple marquee storylines going to get us into all in that we know is going there. And then as the weeks come on, let's build more in. So by the time we get to doing where we preview it, coming into the week of, right? Yep. Ne- for all in, I should have eight. If you were to have, let's say we were going to have 12 matches, I don't know. We'll say 12. Mm-hmm. I should have eight of them. 
and I should be able to tell you what the other four should be. I mean, there might be a wild card one or you know sure. two, but I should be able, if it's going to be 12, I should have eight of them in front of me, two of them that I definitely know, and then you can wild card me the other two if you want. But that's how you build interest in a pay-per-view because, listen, everybody out here that's a talking head and Will Washington, who is in charge, you know, is your right hand man now, should know this from his time at Fightful. And I'm sure his boss, his former boss, Sean Rossap, will agree with me here. Let us talk you up. Mm-hmm. Let us talk our listeners into your doors. Let us talk your listeners into buying your pay per view. Help me help you, brother. You got That's our e- you got our emails. You know, I get a hold of us. Book me, brother. Yeah, book me. I'm just saying. That's that's all I'm saying. With that, that's going to do it for this week's talk. But I would like to point out, it's been seven days since I've offered Tony Khan to do an interview for 607 TWS. And I know some people are like, well, it benefits you. Yes, but it can benefit Tony as well because at least I would have the opening, I would have have a conversation with him, would not be combative, mm-hmm. but still ask the questions that a lot of fans want to know. So once again, seven days since I've asked Tony Khan to come on and do an interview with me and Ken for 607 TWS. We have not heard a response. Every week we'll bring it up to date. It may never happen, but I've offered that avenue and I'd love for him to take it up. Like I say, they know how to get a hold of us. So you guys want to talk? We can talk. So with that, can I tell the fine folks one more time how to find you in the ODPH podcast? Very short, very sweet for anything and everything, including the email address, odphpodcast.com. And if you would like to hit us up, including our email address and everything else, 3fnpodcast.com. With that, until next week, where we uh, get to review Forbidden Door, we get to preview WWE's Money in the Bank, and we get to hit you with that indie roundup, and then all our co- all of our uh, opinions on pro wrestling news. Till next week, 607 TWS. For myself, for Ken M, we're saying take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and most importantly, later wrestling fans. Ah. Top ropes, one, two.